Okay. Um, welcome. That's a good start, isn't it? Um, so we've all seen these wonderful polished presentations. Um, this is not one of those. This is going to be one of those which will probably fall flat on its face. We'll crack a few jokes and pretend it never happened. That kind of thing. Is this working? Uh, not for you. Not. It's not. It is. It is. It is. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Fantastic. Hey. Okay, so here we go. Let's try that one one more time. So, you've all seen those wonderful polished presentations that go as smooth as clockwork. This is not going to be like that. Um, so, all right, you, all you guys, you, you work in the real world and do real things, right? And you all have insane deadlines and stuff like that. Yes? Um, take one step into the cryptocurrency world and it gets 10 times worse. <laughs> which is why we will wing it at times, but we will, um, we will do what we can to give you an idea of what is possibly one of the most exciting areas in software tech that exists today. And if you disagree with me, fine. <laughs> You're probably a lot saner than I am. But anyway, okay, so. I will introduce Brahman. Hello, everyone. That's this guy. He is young, good looking, and then there's me, Dave. I am ancient and falling apart. Brahman runs a thing called Crypto Jobs List, which is a site where if you decide that you're foolish enough to want to get into this kind of technology, go there, find a job, and never look back. Um, I work for a little company in Malaysia called Hello Gold. Uh, we were started to try to help people in like the countries of this region in particular hedge some of their savings into something which wasn't quite as volatile as the currency. Right? Now, many of you are quite young. You may not remember 1997, the Asian currency crisis. I started the business two weeks before it started <laughs> because I have got an amazing sense of timing. Um, in Malaysia, people people who found their savings went down to 15% of the value, right? Um, in Indonesia, it was a heck of a lot worse than that. In Thailand, it was a lot worse. So we're, so our CEO was, was the former chief financial officer of the World Gold Council. He used to run Spider Gold, which is the world's largest gold-based ETF. And he is trying to bring that same concept to ordinary people because also in the countries I've named, not like Singapore, it's very hard for ordinary guys to have access to any kind of decent investments. Okay. So that's what we exist for, to allow people to buy gold, save gold. Um, you know, so if the currency tanks, you've still got something of value. Right, that being said, um, we are, we are? Yeah, we are. Ram, we, are. we did. Raman created a telegram group um, there you go, Solicity Workshop on Telegram. If you, if, you, if you have Telegram, you join into that. Um, at some point we will ask you to send us information and we'll send you back some test ether for various networks and things like that. So when you get there, when we get there, we'll get into it, right? Yep. So enough of this sweet talking, let's get into the business. Um, so here we go. What we're going to try to do is Ethereum smart contracts from basically zero to deployment in approximately three hours because we've wasted the first 30 minutes waffling on, yeah? Okay, here we go. So, the roadmap. What are we going to cover? <coughs> Hopefully, right? First one, first five minutes, what's a blockchain all about? Who knows what blockchains are? I thought so, good. Okay, cool. Um, where smart contracts come in, um, this is like where Ethereum's really strong, something called smart contracts. If you haven't heard about them, you will soon. Um, then decentralization and a whole lot of technical stuff. You'll see it when we get to it. Don't worry about it until we get there. Right, so. So, what we expect you to learn, what the Ethereum blockchain's about, 
a very, very slight grasp of the Solidity programming language. Not much. Um, really, you know, during this we'll throw out loads of random things which, will, which aren't in the notes. Um, we're going to try and point you to some resources, um, one of which is going to be our Telegram channel. You can ask questions, we will respond. Maybe. Um, why security is important, possibly a lot more so than in you know, anything that you've worked on before. And the biggest aim we've got is that you get enough to get you interested to find out the next step. Right? That's the important bit. Because for a lot of people, like you take that, that first baby step takes a lot more courage than the next big leap, right? Or it's that thing that you keep putting off. Once you've got an inkling of what you can do with it, you know, you then start thinking, well, I better allocate, allocate a bit more time. So that's where we're going. So basics of a blockchain in five minutes. I have a strange sense of time. If I get it wrong, don't hold me to it. Right. A blockchain is a load of signed transactions stuffed into blocks which are signed and linked to the previous block. It's up there, you can read it, right? So that everybody agrees that it's, that, that it's correct. That's it. Was that five minutes? No, okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. So, what's a transaction? Well, There you go, that's a transaction, right? Yes. <laughs> I probably don't get that back, do I? Never mind. <laughs> um, right, so from me to Raman, I send him a coffee and I, t and I tell him why I'm doing it uh, because otherwise I'm, he might fall asleep, right? Fair enough, I've got coffee. Hmm. Okay, so assuming that he doesn't drink the bloody coffee, um, yeah, at the end of the day, he's got one coffee, one coffee more, I've got one coffee left. And we keep on doing this, me to you and everything, right? And at the end of the day, we all know how much coffee everybody else has got, as long as we start at the beginning. We probably have to have a transaction make coffee in there somewhere. But that, these, are, these are transactions, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, well, this is like an accounting ledger, yes? So what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that, that, well, the first big deal is that that transaction is signed. So do you know what digital signatures are? Oh, I see a lot. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let, let, let's have someone shout out no. No. There we go. So you don't know what digital <laughs> signatures are. You know what hash functions are, though, don't you? Because you never store passwords in the plane. In the plane, you store an MD5 hash or a or a SHA whatever hash or whatever. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Good. Right. So if I take a hash of that piece of data, assuming I've got a good hash function, nobody can mess with the data, right? So now I've got something that's foolproof, right? except for the fact that if you wanted to change the data, you'd change the hash as well, so that it, still is, it was still reliable, yes? So it still doesn't work. So the next thing you do is, okay, so, but otherwise, if you couldn't mess with the hash, the hash would prove the validity of the data, right? Because you can recompute the hash on the data, the data is valid, yes? Right, um, so, yeah, because like I give you the piece of data and the hash, you recompute the hash, do the two match, yes? Wonderful. Right, so the second part is we encrypt the hash with the sender's private key. Do you know what encryption is? Kinda, right? You know what public key, private key is? It's the thing behind all the SS, SSH technology and that sort of stuff. It's a load of complicated mathematics. I take a piece of data, I do a mathematical transformation with it with one random number. From that random number, I can derive a 
second number that you can use to decrypt it, which I can tell anybody. That's a, a public key. Or you can encrypt it with a public key, and I can read it with a private key. Right? So in this case, if I encrypt the hash with my <coughs> private key, and I let you know what my public key is, right? in this case, it would be the sender, right? because I use my address, which is my public key. So if I say it from my public key, and I encrypt it with my private key, anyone can check that transaction is valid. Right? Because my public key is part of the message in plain text. Right? So you can see my, pub my public key. You can decrypt the encrypted hash to get the correct hash. And you can prove that the decrypted hash matches the hash that you would compute for the data. That's a digital signature. There is no magic to it. And when we talk about cryptocurrencies and all of that stuff, it's the only place that, crypt that cryptography takes place anywhere in anything but the most advanced blockchains, right? So it's all about digital signatures. If that goes over your head, read about it a bit. Um, otherwise, I won't have the five minutes. Um, but that's the very basics, right? Otherwise, think of it as a signature. But it means that, the, that nobody, nobody can forge a transaction from me. Right? There we go. Page two. Right, we stick them in blocks. How do we stick them in blocks? Well, I just assemble them into some kind of an array type structure, some kind of a database record. And I, who put that block together, put a link to the previous block, and I sign the block. And if you put one together, you do the same thing. You sign the block, so we know who did it. Right? So that if, if you have got this block, you can go to the previous block, check the previous block is valid, go to the previous block, and so on. There's, there's a little bit more complicated stuff, so you don't actually have to reevaluate the whole blockchain. Right? But from this and that block, you can tell the entire blockchain is valid. In a manner which everybody agrees upon. And I'm sure you've heard things about how one blockchain transaction costs about as, costs about as much as it does to heat the entire United States for, for a couple of hours or something like that, right? The, block, the, blockchain, the blockchain consumes about as much as the state of Denmark or something like that. Um, I'm going to skip that, right? The method for having the consensus um, is... Let's call it magic for a minute because I think it's not important for where we're coming from. But the technology is there so that the entire members, yeah, everybody, all the nodes on the blockchain agree that the same chain is valid. So that if you put on one block, you put on another block, right? You both try and add something to the blockchain. There is a means of arbitration to decide which one is valid. And then you try again to get the next block, right? So now we have a. I'm oh, sorry, Mike. I'm walking around. I'm making your life difficult. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so now we have a means of ensuring that our ledger is consistent, agreed by everybody. Now, once we have a ledger that's agreed by everybody, we know how much everybody's got, right? There, blockchain, five minutes. Was that it? Yeah, that's your five minutes. Cool. Okay, so where do smart contracts come into this? Because that's the bit that makes Ethereum worth doing. Right? Because what I've just discovered is kind of like the technology behind Ripple and Bitcoin and all these other things. Right? Where really, all that you are talking about is a ledger system that is storing value, right? Bitcoins and things. It's not a real Bitcoin. Of course, Bitcoin is out there in the... So, what's the difference? Ethereum. Well, let's have another look. Um, 
I said I'm sending Raman a coffee because otherwise he might fall asleep. He doesn't drink coffee. He's, he's one of these new breed of, I suppose most of you this new breed of program who don't drink coffee, never mind. Um, now, so that is a whole load of bytes, right? It's a data field. And those among you who have had more fun in programming would think, but hang on, it's a data field. We could do something with that, right? Because that's what you do. You write, you know, I mean, an HTML web page is only a piece of data, but a web browser interprets it and does something fancy, right? Um, and so on, right? So, yeah, maybe we could do something with that, like interpret it as bytecode. That's the thought, right? Now, once we got to that, we, <coughs> we started Ethereum where we said, okay, if I send a transaction to you, or you, or you, or you, it's a transaction to one of you people, normal. But what happens if I send it to address zero, the, the address that nobody can actually own, then what it does is it takes, my, it takes that data <coughs> And it stores it, and it says, and it gives it an address and says, anyone can send anything they like to this now. And you have what's called a smart contract. It's a load of bytes, but Ethereum has a virtual machine, right? You know, much like, you know, uh, which basically is interprets the bytecode, right? So, right, you know, vir you, know you, you all use virtual machines. You know what I'm talking about, right? Um, I mean, typical interpreter of virtual machines out there would be like Microsoft's .NET framework. Java compiles down to bytecodes, which is what makes it portable, right? So, um, once you've done that, you have a smart contract. Now, a smart contract, can you can send things to your smart contract. You can send instructions to your smart contract you can send value. Right, so I mentioned before that Bitcoin, you know, is just a value, right? So I send you 0.1 of a Bitcoin or something like that. You can send half a Bitcoin to someone else. Ether also, or Ethereum also has its own native currency, which is Ether. That's how you send value. But you can also send messages in the data, right? So, the first thing we talked about was me putting a contract out there in co with, with a program encoded in the bike in the data. The next thing I can also do is send parameters, send you know like a rest a rest call where you where you put um, the contract address would be the www dot, and then you've got the path, which becomes the the method name you're trying to call in the contract. And after that, you encode the data, right? So we can, we, can, we can specify which function we want to call, and we can send it parameters. Yeah, go on, go for it. Um, now, code on the blockchain can be seen by anybody. So you know, if you've been happily setting up a Node.js server, you're used to the fact that nobody can see your code unless you publish it on GitHub, right? code on the blockchain. Everything on the blockchain can be seen by anybody. Or at least anybody who knows what they're doing. Right? Um, so if I publish, I mean the first step is I can publish, when I publish a contract, um, a, a, a fantastic little thing called a block explorer, Etherscan, would allow you to see the creation of the contract and say, it will say, this is the code, which is not that fantastic, but I mean, that is the source code of a, of a contract. I can't remember which one, but that's the source code of a contract, right? That gets submitted, it becomes a contract, and you can send transactions to it. And people who communicate with it, Oh, sorry. Yeah, you can verify the source code, of course, because um, once you put it on the blockchain, 
um, Etherscan allow you to upload the source code, which it compiles with the same version of the compiler, and it makes sure that the output matches the code that you sent. If it does, they publish the source code. So now anyone can see your source code. <coughs> this is a token. And it's on the blockchain somewhere. And if you interact with it, using a block explorer, you can see every single interaction with that contract. There is no privacy on the blockchain, right? Unless you build it in. So, I mean, of course you can put encrypted data on there, which only other people who know how to unencrypt it will be able to get hold of, but people can see that you put it there. They can see who put it there, right? So these are transactions on the blockchain. It tells you they've got block numbers, you've got when they were posted, who they're from, who it was sent to. How are we doing? How am I doing for time? Good, good. I've still got a few minutes left, yeah? <laughs> Great. Fantastic. Okay, so <coughs> people refer to blockchain environments as decentralized, trustless. <coughs> right? You build your Node.js application, right? Everybody has to trust you. Right? If you do an online banking application, Everybody has to trust that it works, that it's not going to steal your funds. Nobody can verify it unless you give them access to the source code. And since they can't see in your source code, see inside of your server, they also have to trust that the source code you've given them is the same source code you've currently deployed. <coughs> On the blockchain, you can see exactly what's been deployed. You can see every single transaction. It is designed to create systems where people can interact because they know what they are interacting with. They know how. So I can see your source code, I can see your contract. Uh, if I want to, I can get someone to audit that contract for me to, to prove that it, that it actually does what it says it does. And then I can interact with it. Of course, normally I will trust that your contract is okay. Um, sometimes they're not, right? So, what is more to the point, where is that contract on the blockchain? Whereabouts, geographically? Because like, you know, you've got yours on a Node.js server in an Amazon center somewhere, which they trust they're looking after somehow, right? right? We trust that all of the services we use will not go down. My GitLab. <laughs> yeah, well, I did something worse than that. <laughs> anyway, um, so the point is that you have central points of failure. No matter how hard you try, you have central points of failure, right? Unless you have ridiculous amounts of resources. If I deploy a contract to the blockchain, it is on every single node of the blockchain. So it's on this computer here. It's on computers in Kansas and Indonesia and Mexico and Hawaii and pick a country, yes, right? It's all over the place. It's on thousands if not millions of nodes by now. Um, it's auditable. Um, if you want to interact with my contract, you don't talk to my server anymore, you talk to a, to, a serv to a server near you, you talk to your own notebook. Your notebook communicates to all the other ones, it says, I, this is what I intend to do, and as long as it's, it's, a, it's a legal thing to do, it will get shared amongst all the other nodes. <coughs> now. There are multiple reasons for doing blockchain. As the Long Island T blockchain company know, one of them is to make your company sexy for investors even though you do nothing to do with the blockchain so people throw money at you. But since we're all technical people, we 
walk away from such things, of course. And we do it because it's fun. Um, so, multiple actors, multiple people involved in it who do not necessarily want to have to trust each other. Or who, where, yeah, where it's easy if everything's out there so everything can be audited without any problems, right? Some conflicting interests, right? So it would be no, you know, there's no point, say, Zool and me setting up something to take your money and, and say we would give you something in return if Zool and I are best buddies. Yeah? So, but then, if we've got a few other people involved, so like, yeah, in the case of Hello Gold, we, you know, obviously there's us, there's our vaulting agent dealing with the gold. Um, we allow you to pledge your gold to take loans because also we find that like in Malaysia, 75% of all loans get rejected. So we say if you've managed to save some gold, you can use it against the you know, to, as collateral for a loan, right? So we've got the loan, uh, the loan party. We've got digital wallets that we work with like Cellcom or Axiata, one of the largest uh, regional telecommunications. We've got lots of people involved in our system now. So we have multiple actors, some conflicting interests, right? So, um, you know, for us, you know, if, you know, it, it's, it's good for us to get everybody having loans approved, but of course, Aon Credit want to make sure that the people have got enough gold and it can be locked up until the loan's paid off, right? So there's a conflicting interest there. And of course, there have to be some common goals, otherwise nobody's going to use it. So that is like, a sensible reason for doing it. If there's only one person involved in it, if you are going to be saving records for your own personal use, you can't see how anybody else would be interested in it. And even if they are, you could just stick it up in a blog post. There's no point doing a blockchain, right? If only one person ever interacts with it, it's a database, right? So now we've got this byte code and nobody, well not nobody, there are maybe four or five people out there who, who are even further off into the land of crazies than I am. So very few people write, by, you know, write pure byte code. Very few people write assembler. They all use a language. Of these, the languages are Solidity, which is inspired by JavaScript. Serpent was something which came from Python, which they're now getting rid of because it was hard to make it secure. Viper is something which is new and unstable. LLL, lots of people have got their different names for it. Low level language, lovely little language. I don't know what it stands for. Not many people use it. People can use Assembler. The Ethereum virtual machine is a stack machine. Most people use Solidity, which as I say is inspired by JavaScript, which should get you all taking a brief a big sigh of relief, right? Because you've all got an advantage here. Okay, so we're going to talk about solidity. Solidity is used to write programs or write contracts. Contracts are a little bit like objects, as in object inheritance C++ or Java type thing, right? Um, I hope most of us have been into other areas. So I, I believe that JavaScript doesn't have objects quite like that, does it? You'll have to correct me here. Sorry, I, I have done JavaScript a few times over the years, but my mind has moved on. 
Um, it has classes. It's close enough. It does have classes. It's close enough. Good, right. So think of it like a class, right? So a contract's a bit like a class. It has a constructor. We got constructors? Yeah. Yeah, cool. So you've got constructors, parameters. You've got functions that do things. You've got functions that don't do things. They just tell you something. Yeah, like, yeah, what's the price of tea today? Yeah, you don't actually change anything to get the price of tea. You just, right? Um, we have persistent state data, which you must have, right? I'm sure if, if anybody can, if, if I'm saying something and you can think of the right word in JavaScript to describe it, shout it out, right? So what's the state data for, for a class in, in JavaScript? Yeah, I set some, I, I have two functions. Someone calls the first function, they change something, and the second function actually can still see that change data. What would you call that? An instance huh? data? Yeah, okay. So state, state, state data is instance data in JavaScript, right? And of course, you've got local variables and things which um, get thrown away the moment you leave the functions. Um, we can also talk from one contract to another, just like you can have one, one object call another object. Bingo. So it's a language that's not entirely unlike JavaScript. And if I show you that, you'd say to yourself, this is JavaScript, right? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Good. If I talk rubbish, you can throw things, you know. <laughs> uh -huh. laptops. If you can't hear me, tell me to talk up. We should um, do like a few minutes Q&A. Are you guys following questions so far? There have been a few questions in the chat. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Let, uh, let's, let's, leave, let's leave the caveat page, shall we? What's the Telegram <laughs> Huh? Uh, Telegram, it's, uh, can you get, it's like t.me slash Solidity Workshop. Let's, uh, let's back it up all the way. Yeah, go all the way back. There you go. There you go. It's a, a bit of a tricky one, but... Yeah, let's do like 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's coming real soon. Yeah. Um, Everyone's joining? Anybody else got anything before I... No. Come on. Come on, this guys. Is, this is like a Singapore classroom, isn't it? <laughs> Nobody asks any questions. It's probably kind of not making any sense at all. We will now try and find exactly where I was. So, where we were... Where were we? Did you guys manage to get to the Telegram group? Shall we get a few min more minutes? What would be good is a concrete example of what you're doing with these things. Right. Okay, yeah, so we're going to get into it. Real like, soon. A bit right. of a theory um, right now for this. Just for, after for okay. Just after this page here, right? So as you can see, Solidity is exactly like JavaScript, right? Solidity Except for the... <laughs> Except for the semicolons. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I forgot the semicolon. There should be yeah, a semicolon. Yeah. There's quite a few. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, I didn't test it. I normally test my code. I didn't test that. I'm very sorry. Okay, except for the fact that, okay, contracts. Well, we know about contracts. Contracts are like classes. That's there. Gas. Now, that's the fun one. Um, when you interact with anything on the blockchain, to change anything on the blockchain, you have to pay for it. Because the blockchain is stored, stored on multiple computers across the network. There are computers making, there are people out there making sure that the network, that the blockchain stays consistent. And they're all doing a lot of work to do that, and they get paid for it. So if you want to interact with a, con with a contract in such a way that it changes anything, whether it's just me sending ether to somebody, or whether it is me changing of changing data before something like that, have to pay for it because it goes into my local node. My local node shares it across the entire thousands and thousands of nodes, and they all agree and say, "Yep, that's fine." Or they say, "No, you can't do that." So you have to pay for it. You pay for it in ether, and it's called gas. How much you pay for a transaction depends upon, number one, how much work is involved. Some things take more computing power than others, 
or more storage space. So you pay more if you're going to use a lot of storage space. You pay more if you've got like a lot of computation. And the second thing is an incentivization thing where you actually decide how much you want to pay per unit of gas. Now you do that because if you're putting a transaction out there, someone has to mine it and the person who mines it gets paid the transaction fees. And if you're prepared to pay more, you, you can get priority. <coughs> right? So you pay for every transaction. The types are a bit different. We don't have integers. Or the most common things in Ethereum are addresses, which is a 256-bit value, and a 256-bit unsigned integer. Yeah. I don't believe they even have signed integers, do they? Or if they do, I've never seen anybody using them. Every, the chief currency is the 256-bit unsigned integer. How about floating points? No. <coughs> no, F floating point numbers are usually dealt with as 256-bit <coughs> unsigned integers where the last 18 decimal points are regarded as fractions. Right? They are talking about at some point they might have fixed point numbers just for fun. Sorry, Mike. Right. Um, every transaction, if it succeeds, can create, can, can interact with events to log information that you can see. It, normally, if you do something, it's the only way you can find out what goes on. You make a log, or you can examine the state of the contract. Um, so I did mention, when you interact with a contract, there is, there is the other thing you can do. You can just, as I say, if you, if you want to know the value of something, you want to do something that does not involve changing state, you don't need to query the whole network. You can, only, you can query a local node. That is free. Right? You don't have to pay to make a query. You only have to pay to change things. Because your node should be in exactly the same state as everybody else's node, so you can query. Um, the state, state memory, right? This, the, the persistent memory, costs money in gas, right? Recursion, not advisable. Right? We all know that you know, all programmers that want to have any fun start thinking about recursion. Please, not in, not in Solidity. It's only got a, it's only got a limited stack yeah. size to start with. Maybe we can speed up for this section yeah. because like okay. a lot of work. Okay. Like, we're going to go in a okay. practice section. You're quite right, yeah. Um, so there are a whole lot of other things. A lot of it's about, okay, the key ones. Um, you have to specify if your contract's going to receive ether. A contract that, can, that you do not specify to receive ether, if somebody sends ether to it, it will, it will reject it. Um, what else is key? Um, okay, I think this is, probably, this is probably the best one here. Multiple values, you can return multiple values. Can you do that in JavaScript? Yes. A function returns two values? Yes, yes. Oh, we got that. Okay, fine. Then it's all right. Um, and you can throw the last very important thing. You can, at any point in the execution of a function, the function can say, if this happens, roll back. Roll back the entire transaction. So it doesn't matter what's happened to how, how much information has changed up to this point. If something happens, throw it all away. Do not change anything. Right? So that, you do a, you have a require or assert, or you do, do a revert. Yeah, okay, let's go. Where are we? Okay, so, things required for a contract. The first line of your contract will say that it will specify the Solidity version you're using. It has to be above a certain version. Right, the latest version so far is 0.4.19. So if I put that as my top line, I can't use an old, older compiler to build it. You can have includes. We know about includes, right? Um, you you specify the contract, like specifying your class. You just you you do your state variables. We have modifiers now. Modifiers are fun. Modifiers are conditions that are required to execute a function. So 
only the owner of the contract can execute this. Or you can only execute this if it's after January the 26th. Things like that. Um, is that me? Let <laughs> me. Oh, fine. No, just do that. Okay. Fine. <laughs> Sorry about that. I should be on silent. Imagine it's on silent. Um, we'll look at we'll look at the rest. I think we I think we have most of the things in the next few lines. Um, right now, at this point, I'm going to take you through writing a very simple contract, or at least I'm not going to get you to write it. I'm going to get you to copy it. Um, if you look at on GitHub Gists, um, there is a contract called Buy Gold under Golden Dave on there. If you, if you load that, ah. and you go to, um, and you, you open a browser tab, another tab preferably, to remix.ethereum.org. I shared the link in the uh, Ethereum chat. That is cool. Thank you. Um, now, if you do that, you have an interactive environment for messing around with contracts. And it allows you, so what I'm suggesting that you do is you create a new tab in Remix, you copy the code from the GIST, and stick it in there, and then we can all be on the same kind of page. <coughs> right. So I'm not going to talk about all of this, all of this contract because I've actually got two two contracts there. One talks to the other. I'm not going to talk about using the second one. Just the first one, but you can play with it. So. The, the second contract is designed to interact with the first one. That's all I'm going to say there. Um, are we? It, the information's in the in the thing, right? Yeah. Okay. So if we can go to the next page, then. Right. Now, one of remix is designed to not only work in an interactive mode, it can also talk to the blockchain using something called Web3.js, which Raman has promised me he's going to tell you about later. Right? But at the moment, we're going to work in an emulated environment using the JavaScript VM. So on the settings page, you will see, is it settings page? or the, Sorry, on the run page, you have the environment JavaScript VM. And you have got about 10 different accounts. Yes? What, sorry? Oh, sorry, okay, five accounts. Enough to play with, anyway. Right. Now, use the JavaScript VM, use the first of those accounts, and take the con take the contract exchange rate and click. Cl um, now, you've got to give it two addresses here, right? So, I think I'm going to have to get out of my present mode and do a bit of showing. Uh, how are we doing so far, guys? What are the questions? I did. did I'm sure, you have questions. Did I warn them it was going to get difficult? You just run through that from the top. Been okay. Yeah. So, uh, just go ahead. You do the talking. I'll do the doing. <laughs> you try and okay. explain what I'm doing because I haven't. Seven. Got what was the question? To run through. Run through. Yes. Cool. So, uh, we're like Remix is like interactive environment where you can interact with your. Um, um, that's not what people really use in like the day to day Ethereum engineering or Solidity engineering. Work, but it's like a really nice interactive environment where you can like really quickly uh, test ideas and maybe debug contracts as well. Um, 
So remix.ethereum.org. Have everyone loaded it? Raise your hands who loaded the, uh, this editor in their browser. Right. OK, excellent, excellent. Okay. So you've got this tiny plus here. You could add a new, add a new tab. I'm sure you figured that out yeah. by now. You add a new tab. You paste the code into this tab. On the right hand Everyone done that? Everyone uh, entered the um, copy paste that they just? Once you've done it, you may need to compile it by clicking upon this button in the Compile tab, Start to Compile. And if all goes well, it just says, OK, Groovy, we've done it. Anyone having a, is it not compiling for anyone? Not compiling. <laughs> so can you have a look at the guy who's, whose code is yeah, not sure. compiling? Yeah, it's all good. Can you get it? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, it's not Yeah, so it's like, it means that it's, it's all good. Right. So we go to the run tab. Um, there are various options here. Uh, injected Web3 or um, talking to a Web3 provider. That means you can talk to a node on your own computer. Can I zoom? Yeah, I can do my best to zoom. Here we go. How about that? So you have got source. We're going to use the JavaScript VM. Later on, Raman's going to talk about using MetaMask, which would be Injective Web 3. But at the moment, we'll stick with the JavaScript VM. You have got five accounts that you can use for sending transactions. Each of them has got 100 virtual Ether that you can pay for things with, right? Is that, is that clear? Questions? So we start with, we're going to start with the first account. Let me just cleared that one forfed. Right, so we're going to create exchange rates. Now, when under create, it says there are two addresses, which if I was going to come over here a bit, you will see under exchange rate, it has address gold source, address cash source, right? Um, what am I looking there? I can look here. I'm an yeah. idiot. Right, sorry, ignore me. Right, here we go. So I need two addresses. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be using three of my addresses here. I'm going to set the second address to be my gold source, my third address to be my cash source, right? Because it wants three different accounts to interact with it. Now, it's a bit finicky. It wants, it wants addresses and long numbers to be inside quotes. So the way I normally do that is I put my quotes in first. I'm then going to put in the third one, which is that. You can just copy the address. You can paste it in. You go back. You choose your second address. You copy that. You paste that in. Right, so I've got two different addresses. This is 0x14, 4b. Right? Yeah. Okay, then I click the create button. <coughs> and it creates the object for me. So basically when you when you hit a create button, right? Uh, are you guys there? No. Okay. So it basically creates a contract within a DM, uh, within a in memory JavaScript VM that compiles it into into bytecode and this thing is uh, what what you see in this area is just like interfaces that you can interact with with the contract. Um, it's just like a nice UI that Remix provides you with. Uh, later on, we're gonna go into like uh, just like, just like sublime text, and uh, I'm gonna show you guys. Um, that, like you know, you'll be able to build the UI yourself, um, and it's all gonna make sense hopefully. <laughs> right. So you can examine variables. The gold source. This was the address I created it. This was the address I put in the first one, 014. You can see the cash source down there. OK. You can, you can see the two, two variables I put in the constructor, the gold source and the cash source. You just click on these two buttons, and it reveals the value. So the blue buttons are either looking at the value of a variable, or it is calling a constant function that changes nothing. Right? Um, 
all variables in solidity are initialized to false or zero or null, depending upon what the type is, right? Um, gold price in here. Let's get a, let's have a look at some of the code for a minute. We'll go back to this in terms of what I was saying. The first line tells it the tells it that we are contract in solidity. Compile it with uh, 419 or higher. The second line declares the contract. You can have inheritance, as I've said before, in which case you say exchange rate is something else. But if you're interested, you'll find that out, right? I have got two addresses which are public, gold source and cash source. Now, the important thing about this is that all public variables have getters created for them. Right? So you can read those values. So when you're talking from one function to another, you never actually interact with the variable, you inter interact with the automatically created getter. Right? Uh, I have got two maps. Okay, let me tell you what I'm trying to do here now, because we've, we've launched the contract. Um, so, this is just an example from the kind of stuff I do, because I, I, I play best with the stuff I'm familiar with, right? So, Hello Gold, buy their gold in Singapore from Bullion Star International. They're on Northbridge Road. They're a, they're a, a decent vaulting agent, right? Um, but we're selling in Malaysia. So, I've got two things that affect the price of my gold. I've got the price I paid in Singapore dollars, and I've got the exchange rate between Singapore dollars and Malaysian ringgit. We've just opened an office in Thailand, which in the course of the next few months will be rolling out the product into Thailand. So now I'm going to need to have the exchange rate from of the price of gold in Malaysian ringgit and in Thai baht. This is designed to allow me to put in the two pieces of information from two different sources, right? From the fellow who, who, who's checking out the international exchange rates and the fellow who's, who's, who's putting in the gold prices, right? So, I have got, so the first, um, the first two lines, gold source and cash source, these are the people that I am going to authorize to put in those transactions because I don't want you putting in the fact that gold is one dollar a kilo and then quickly buying gold. Right? I mean, I know I'm mean, but that's me. Right? Um, and similarly for the person putting in the exchange rates, we don't want you putting in that there are, you know, that one Malaysian ringgit is worth five thousand Singapore dollars. That would have the same effect. You get cheap gold, right? Um, So, okay, so I'm going to have, because there are multiple currencies, I use a mapping. Now, a mapping is an associated array, you know what they are, right? So I can use like MYR for Malaysian ringgit to give me one value in the array, right? Other terms are an associative array. And the same thing would be cash ready, which which I'm simply using to say that that value has actually been set and is valid. Because I don't want you trying to do a transaction with a currency that hasn't been set. Right? I could have done structures, but I didn't. OK, so when we created it, we had the constructor. I passed in gold source underscore, cash source underscore, which I put into those two values. And because I did that, you can click on the blue buttons and see those values. Um, we got a function called set gold price, which is a public function. Anybody can call it. Which doesn't sound right because I just said only the gold source can call it, right? But 
The second line says require message dot sender equals gold is equal to the gold source. So if anybody else does call it, the second line will cause that transaction to revert, meaning it will stop execution. Any changes that you might have made, which in this case are none, will be unwound. If you get past that hurdle, you set the gold price and you set the flag saying that, that the gold price is now valid. Because I don't want anybody calling the contract until both the gold price is valid and their currency exchange rate is valid. Um, for the cash rate, <coughs> well, the, the sender has to be the cash source. Same thing, right? The gold person can't set the cash price, the cash exchange rate. And I set, I set the rate, which would be for Malaysian ringgit, about three, right? So I make entry number, th the entry of MYR in there to three, and I set cash ready to true, which means now you can talk, you can get a Malaysian ringgit exchange rate. And then we have the function to get the gold, gold price. Now, this one's a little bit different. It says public. Anybody can call it. It is view. Now, view means it accesses state variables, but it does not change anything. So it's a constant function. Now, a constant function, as I mentioned earlier, you can call it from any node in the network. You do not need to communicate anything to any other node in the network to know that you've called it. Therefore, it's a free call. <coughs> it's still hot. These are amazing. Made in Malaysia. Lovely coffee. <laughs> OK, right, so here. If cash ready currency return, right? Now what does that actually do? Well, what, what it does is, is the bit you can't see, which is the right hand side. It returns the price and an OK flag. The price is, before, before you change it, it's initialized to zero. The OK flag is initialized to false. So, <coughs> we come. so if the cat if you have never initialized the exchange rate, it just returns, which means it will return with OK being false. If the gold is not ready, it will also return, so OK will be false. Otherwise, price equals cash rates times currency divided by one ether. <coughs> what the hell am I talking about in there? Well, obviously, you can get the bit where you multiply the cash rate by the currency, right? By, by the gold price. So, three Malaysian ringgit times 50 Singapore, sorry, three ringgit to the Sing dollar times 50 Sing dollars to, to a gram, right? will give you 150 ringgit to a gram. What is the divide by one ether? No, it wasn't a rhetorical question. What is the one ether doing there? It's the cost of the transaction. Huh? It's like the cost of the transaction. No. No, no. Anybody know the exchange rate from, from Malaysian ringgit to Singapore dollars? Sorry, can you shout that one out? That sounded good. Three point what? Uh, two point something, two point nine eight, three point zero seven. Just taking exchange rate conversion to Ethereum. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's, it's, it's got decimal points in there somewhere, right? What is the price of gold? One gram of gold in Singapore dollars. Oh, I've got no idea. It's probably I mean, like it used to be about fifty point three two. So like, we got decimal places in there, haven't we, guys? How do we represent numbers in Ethereum? Because both numbers are multiplied by 10 to the 18. Right? So if it's $50, the actual number in there is 50 times 10 to the 18. The exchange rate is 3 times 10 to the 18. 
So if you multiply two numbers, both of which are the whole number multiplied by 10 to the 18, you're going to have to divide by 10 to the 18 to normalize it back to a number with 18 decimal places. Yes? No? Maybe? Yeah. Right. Because if I put 100 to represent 1, so I want to put 1.1, it's 100 times 100, which is 1 with four zeros after it, so I'd have to take off two zeros afterwards to make it equal back to equal 1, wouldn't I? Yeah? Bingo. So that's why I'm dividing by 1 ether. And at the end of that, I say OK equals true, so that when I return, we know it's valid. Does that work for you? No. Cool. No. no. Why, why, why would you see the result of dividing by one? Because one ether, is, one ether is one followed by 18 decimal places. Oh, okay. That's <laughs> yeah, sorry. So one ether, is, one ether is, is just like everything else. It's one with 18 decimal places. So it's just a convenient way of saying one followed by 18 zeros. OK, so there we go. I have a function that gets the gold price. And if we are incredibly lucky, it might work. Um, it ought to work. It worked when I was sitting in the car, parked, waiting for Zul to get back to his hotel because he'd been off sightseeing. Oh, by the way, sorry, I, did I introduce Zul at the back? <coughs> Zul is my colleague from Hello Gold. No, no, go look at him. Right, can you please all join me and say just one thing to Zul? Happy birthday, Zul! <laughs> Thank you. Right. Okay, good. Right, so we've done that, we've done that. Um, what's the gold price for the Thai? Well, have we done Thai Bart? What's the gold price for Thai Bart? Let's have a look. T. H. B. Close the quotes. Get the gold price. That's not okay, is it? Because I never set the. I never actually. I've never set anything for the minute. Okay, so we, let's set some values here. And I'm going to be incredibly lazy. We're going to we're going to choose those things that I originally went up with. So the gold price is going to be 50, followed by 18 zeros, which I always do as one, two, three. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Put in the quotes because it's a big number and for some reason they like big numbers in quotes. Take out all the spaces. You done it? Yeah, last one. And, <coughs> sorry, what's the gold price at the moment? Gold price is zero. Set the gold price. And it says you've got all of this, all of this. Hang on, somewhere on the left-hand side. Look at it in a minute. It's, it, it kind of it kind of succeeded, but you can prove it succeeded because you can check the gold price. Right. So now I've set the gold price in this thing, and every single node on the Ethereum network, if this was a live contract, would know that the gold price is fifty. Right. And I could set the exchange rate for Malaysian ringgit. There's my double quote there. Two. Three. Also followed by 18 digits. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, <coughs> ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Followed by its quote. We call set cash rate for Malaysian ringgit. And what did it say? It said I did something wrong. Ah! And the reason it did something wrong was I sent it from the wrong, from the wrong account. Because up here are the accounts I, should, I can send from. I need to be sending from the cash source, which is the one with 4B, which is there. So it says here that the transaction failed. If I try to send exactly the same transaction from that account, if I'm very lucky, it says it succeeded. And 
If I ask it for the tie bar price, it will say failed. If I ask it for the Malaysian ringgit price, if I am incredibly lucky, it will tell me the price is 15 ringgit, no, 150 ringgit per gram of gold. Right? Now, that is an insanely simple example, and that would be just a very small part of a big hole that you put together. Sorry, zoom which bit? On the right side. Um, this side. Zoom it, yeah, okay. Why not? Oh, yeah. Huh? Come on. Uh -huh. Is that the bit you wanted? No, no, just use like Zoom in, zoom in. There's a plus or minus. Do you think that plus or minus does anything? No, I doubt it. That's just it does. Oh, yeah, that's true. Oh. That it will do it, that didn't happen. Uh, I'm on the wrong side, am I? Why did I do that? You just like enter no, it's there, it's okay, just do that, it comes back. Yes, take that back up, and forget it, let's just do that. Yeah. There you go, Was, is that okay? Unfortunately, they don't make these draggable. So, we have looked in here at using some of the principal things that are important. The first one is controlling permissions by the address from which the transaction is sent. The second one is um, the various data types, including the associative array. Right? It's, it's basically it's a sparse array. Uh, but you've got maps. you got maps in JavaScript, haven't you? It's the same thing, right? Um, Um, are there any questions at this point? I think a few people are still playing with it. Okay. The great thing about this environment is it's just like JS Fiddle. You can change something. You can you can you can see the results instantly. Um, one thing that one thing I've noticed is a lot of people only make what is absolutely necessary public. I tend to make everything possible public because it because you never know when you're going to have to debug something. Right? You can always work out what a variable should be, so there's no point hiding it. Just make it public so that it's there and you can see it clearly. Right, so how are we doing with that? Is everybody happy? So what, what exactly is the difference there? Why would anybody put something as private? Um, people do... Well, I mean, you put functions private. It's very essential to put functions private. Right? The moment you put something on, 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 the, on the network which holds data, which is important, that holds ether, you have to have private functions. Otherwise, people can get in there and they're going to nick your ether. Right? Um, uh, so but a public function can pub be invoked by anybody. Private functions can only Correct. be invoked by other public functions. Can only can only be invoked from inside. Yes. Um, for, for variables, uh, in my view, it's not terribly necessary unless you're absolutely confident everything works well. Um, if you are, if you are, if you, you know, if you've got something fully debugged and everything else, yeah, you can set things to private, just because it makes the interface clearer. You know, because you can see on the right hand side I've got everything listed there. You don't want it cluttered by rubbish with 500 different variables. Okay, so are we ready to move on from there?
Raman should be nervous because now it's up to him. Okay, he's still doing something. So, do we have any other questions at this point? Could you get the Okay, so obviously at this point I've got something with Mickey Mouse, right? And you say, well, why wouldn't I do it on a centralized server? Um, the first thing is if I want my system to be publicly auditable, and I want to have, as I say, the different actors who don't, I don't need to give them special access to a particular server. They can all interact directly with their own local nodes, which gives them, gives them access to the contract. Um, second one was when you want massive adoption and you don't want people having clients. Or you, know, you can have a web client, but the web client can talk directly to the net but without even having a back end, which is where Web3.js comes in. And that is like, web, web, uh, a very brief heads up on it before we start, Web3.js is a way to do all of your interaction, including signing of transactions, inside your browser, right? And the only time it leaves your browser is as a signed transaction, and it goes, it goes either into your local node on your machine, or through an HTT port which just puts the signed transaction into the transaction port. Okay. Now, I'm quite sure that you have heard, like for example, about you know, IC, the ICO, initial coin offerings, the ways that, one of the ways that startups are raising huge amounts of money to, you know, to develop products with. That is done on the blockchain people send Ether to the contract, they get something called a token. A token is just a value in an associative array, basically, with functions to allow you to transfer those tokens. Right, so you can sell your tokens and stuff. How are you doing, Raman? I think he's helping people so he doesn't have to come up and do the next bit. Uh, can contracts be updated <laughs> after they've been launched? Okay, now here's the fun bit. Yes. Can you update a, co a contract once it has been launched? Um, from what I've said so far, what do you think the answer is? No. Kind of no. You can replace them. At least you can't replace it, you can put in another one. So if I have this contract with a pointer to the contract I'm supposed to use, so this, the first contract becomes like a portal, you can then change the second level contracts. I can make it so that a contract can be stopped from working altogether. One of the things up there is self-destruct. I can actually remove a contract from the blockchain completely by issuing a self-destruct function. But I cannot change anything that has been written onto the blockchain, which makes the company who put name, email, address, and other information of their clients onto the blockchain as they registered them in plain text, rather irresponsible because that information is going to be there forever. Yeah. So you can, have, you can upgrade contracts if you build it in, <coughs> but you have to design it because the old contract will always be there. So if you were to look, for example, that if you have a contract where somebody made a mistake at sending wrong information to it, it's always there. Um, yeah. <coughs> so, yeah. So, so in your uh, set, set goal value uh, uh, function, you have locked that down so it only be one zero point. This one is your address. You don't even set that down. What if you wanted to do something like the, uh, the interbank interest rate type thing where, where everybody's publishing their rates, you're performing some kind of activity over that? Would you want to? Sorry, how can you get around the idea 
here is kind of have every single person publishing their keys and aggregating those things and having a contract that you go and get the information rather than having a contract that needs to be a special piece of Um, okay. The blockchain, yeah, the blockchain cannot talk to anybody. Right? <coughs> However, logs may help you. Um, because, okay, I haven't put any in here, foolish me, but if I had put an event in there, you call it an event, it looks like a function, but, it's, but instead of saying function, it says event. When you call that, the only thing it does is write a log that gets stored with the transaction call if the transaction succeeds. You can have code written in JavaScript using Web3.js or written in Go, which is my favorite, which talks directly to the node, which monitors your contract for, uh, for a particular event. So you can have you know, a machine somewhere that sees that something has been called to make that event happen. And then that computer, when it when it recognizes that, it can go and do something and put and push the information back. How are we doing, guys? But one thing you have to understand if you do that is time elapses. Right? In that time, more transactions will be posted. You do not have a way to go out, sign the system, get information, get it back to you. Right. It's like sending off a carrier pigeon. At some point in the future, it comes back. But you've been, you've been open for business in the meantime. I mean, yeah, there are multi. I mean, like, yeah, just as a programmer, you can think. Yeah, you just have to think of ways around you know, having some, maybe an aggregator pushing the transaction, or maybe each person will put in their own exchange rates, so they all have keys built in. Uh, the, the caller, yeah, right. So like right now here, like you basically in this right. environment, you have like thousand ether primitives. So in a real environment, you have thousand ether primitives. Oh, I'm on a tab. Which tab am I on? And then your account will have the That's return. And then you will, when, when you like, make this so we've done that. Yeah. We did that. We did that. Um, you saw that. Right. If you're sending ether no. to the contract, the ether, the contract going to So if you're sending. Literally, that is sort of like, seriously, a very brief introduction to it. Right? Anybody can query it, certain people can write information, you can have functions that anybody can send, and so on. Yeah, um, Now, at that point, I'm going to leave it, because I think if you think there's something interesting, you might start taking the journey at this point, right? Yeah. As with everything else, Google's your first best friend. Unless you don't like giving information away, this is duck, duck, go, right? Um, now, it's this guy's turn. Me? Yeah, your turn, mate. Okay, sure. Uh, can you come and debug this? <laughs> <laughs> can, can, can you go and debug these? Oh, oh, yeah, so uh, how are you guys doing so far? Uh, everyone's following, having success, certain level of success, failure. Who's compiling everything and uh, everything works for them? Raise your hand. You can drain my battery. Ooh, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Who's uh, having a problems with like creating a contract or setting values? Or is confused about like how like okay disclaimer like everything's here is very confusing. When I was learning myself, it was like super confusing. So <laughs> it's okay to be confused. Um, so just like you know, raise your hand and ask questions. Like, there are, like, all questions that are are good. Uh, okay, back there. What's the question? Uh, I think there was like a, a confusion. Like you just need uh, to address this. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, you just need to address this because the construction function it takes two addresses. Um, the one address that is able to set the goal value, and another one that you shouldn't create. What does actually mean? Yeah. Okay, so the question is what what's the addresses mean? So like on Ethereum and blockchain, there are like there are addresses, like the public address, the hex code. It's a what is it? It's like a 
it's I think it's yeah, like it's a hash address of your uh, public key, uh, and basically you have a private key that controls like the, the, you sign the transactions, and anyone can like verify that you signed this certain transaction or certain interaction on the blockchain uh, by looking at your public key, right? So, and tr the, um, the address can either mean like a private individual, basically, like sort of like you can, you have a um, private key to this address and you can just sign transactions like you wanna send someone ether right to another um, address or to another contract. And contracts also have the same um, public addresses, right? Is that more or less? Yeah, it's a it's it's not a unique address for participating node. It's a unique address that corresponds to like a private key. So you able to generate your own private key, uh, set of private keys. Uh, this guy is smiling. <laughs> um, yeah, and they're they're unique. If you lose the private key, you lose access to your uh, uh, to your public key. Basically, you cannot move your funds. As a, Sorry, you had a question? You yeah. had a comments? Yeah. Okay, no wish. <laughs> okay. Is it confusing? Not confusing? Uh, what should we explain better? Uh, yeah, pair of keys is basically like an account. Uh, when 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 people when you hear the rumors about people losing like a ton of money on Bitcoin or something, that actually means that this value is still there on the blockchain. It's recorded there, but it sits in a like it's attributed to a public key that someone lost the private keys to, so they cannot like move this Ether or Bitcoin out. Does it make sense? Yeah, but sort of like basically address is a user, but you can generate like infinite number of, yeah, I think close to infinity, uh, number of uh, key pairs. Does it make sense for us? Uh, not necessarily, like you can create like a billion number of addresses. It's just like a hash function. So you generate. So the question is like, for each contract you generate address. So like when you when you publish a contract to a chain, whether it's a, your own local chain or whether it's actually the main Ethereum network, uh, the, the address is being generated for you by the by all the nodes. I don't remember exactly what's, what's the process of generating this address, but I think it's, it's like based on the time and, and the block number and the months of that block in which the contract is being mined in. It's, it's a bit tricky, <laughs> more or less. It's, it's unique, it's unique. There is like, uh, like I'm not a hardcore cryptographer science, scientist, but it's like the probability of collision of addresses is like tending to zero. Like it's pretty impossible, uh, yeah. Question so far? Uh, shall we go into... Yeah, I want one last tough, tough technical question. Yeah. I've got a few hats. Who wants a hat? Who wants a hat? Okay, okay. Question. <laughs> that was his answer. Does it come in black? Does it come in black? No, a hat doesn't come in black. I'm sorry. Okay. I've got more. I can refund you. <laughs> oh, wow. It's a transaction. Yeah, transaction. <laughs> cool. I got more. Okay, so uh, like, w what we plan to do now is like basically ask questions. I'm gonna run uh, answering them, and then we're gonna do a bit more hands-on um, work and try to link it to our experience with JavaScript and Node. Does that sound a good idea? Question. Can you throw out some real-world examples of what you're gonna do? real-world? Okay, so real-world uh, things that people are actually doing with Solidity. Uh, so like. <laughs> That's that's kind of somewhat a tricky part. Well, not really. Well, this was so, I don't know. I, I put it like as a tricky part. Like the most popular thing that everyone's crazy about is like ICOs. Is basically raising ton of ton of money. Uh, I'm actually a bit bored by that by that uh, topic. Um, so that's that's one way. Like issue in a token. Yeah. Um, another good use case would yeah, be crypto kitties. Crypto kitties. Uh, <laughs> so like it, very good use cases when you have um, like multi party. Um, okay. Marketplace, right? Where participants in that marketplace do not necessarily trust the intermediary. So, for example, like if you're playing online poker, huh? You're a drug dealer. Um, drug. Um, I don't know. <laughs> not in Singapore. I don't know. Um, so, for example, if you're playing online poker, right? And uh, I'm not a poker player, but still, um, you're playing online poker, and you kind of you go to this website, and you do not necessarily 
like you, you, you might think like, okay, this website is their business, that then probably they might have a certain business incentive to have their backend logic play in their favor, right? So like you, you pick your cards and you think like, okay, what if the, the owner of the business uh, modify their backend code and have some certain like smart AI that will uh, perform certain logic that like there's no way or like very low chances of you winning, right? Yeah. Simon, does that make sense? Okay, and with, with blockchain, what you can do is you can basically have this like backend uh, logic, you publish it to the network, and when people interact with, with those contracts, like anyone can review the actual source code or what's going on behind the scenes, and you can exactly see, like the, the exciting part of it is that you actually interact with real money, right? If you have anyone build like a Stripe or a brain tree integration or anything like that, please raise your hands. Higher, higher, higher. Okay, like we've, de we've done, dealt with money, right? So the exciting part with with Ethereum and with blockchain, it's like there is no like, API. It's like it's like baked in. Uh, like I've got, yeah. I've got quite a few things, quite a few examples I can give you actually when you've done. Yeah, sure. Uh, let me finish. So like, yeah. does it make sense so far? So like basically anyone can go even with Etherscan or other methods, go into contract address and see the exact source code of that of that contract, and uh, you're able to like decide for yourself. Uh, whether this code is doing something shady, or whether it's uh, being a legitimate code and it's being like assigning rewards in a just manner to all the participants, right? So that, like that's that's for example like why CryptoKitties was like such a, I mean, it doesn't really explain why it was like a hit, but the the way it works is that you can kind of buy and sell those cats, and you can be assured that like the owner of this game is not exactly like manipulating, creating duplicates. Um, it's, it's all stored and verifiable in blockchain. You can see all transactions like publicly. So how are people predicting against IP theft in that context? Okay, that's that, that's. I can, I, can, I can give you that one. Do you want to? Okay. What kind of IP? Well, I, I wrote the ultimate poker engine and I published up the. Then no, anybody, anybody, can, anybody, anybody so can take it. Copies, yeah, anyone can. Any, copy anybody it. can take it. Yeah, right. Very simple. You got to, uh, but once you, if it's going to really, you know, you can have offline parts of it, but anything you put on the blockchain is public. And, okay, so, you wanted real world cases. First one, Giveth. Giveth were one of the, uh, okay, Hello Gold, we actually had a token sale, we made some money on Hot Mod, and as a result of that, we supported a number of people in the community who we felt were doing good work. And in the Ethereum community, there are a load of people doing good work. One of them is Giveth. Giveth have designed a framework for, for charities to raise money and for, you know, they raise money so people contribute in the form of ether, but they have to lock in goals according to, according to a roadmap. As they achieve the goals along those roadmaps, funds get released to them. Right? The UNHCR have got, have got <coughs> a private Ethereum network which they use to channel funds to refugees and refugee camps. So, you know, I mean, they, you know, if they end up talking to their banks at both sides, but they, they, they target the right person. They integrate the blockchain technology with iris scanners, so a refugee in the camp can go into, into designated st stores in the camp, take the goods he wants, he scans his iris, and it registers with the blockchain that he has received a certain amount of funds to pay for those goods. Right? Uh, <coughs> Ethereum... Yeah, right. Yeah, most of what we talk about be the public Ethereum network. J.P. Morgan have created a version of Ethereum called Quorum, which has a level of privacy built in, and that they are proposing to the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance as one of the technologies for interbank you know, record passing, you know, fund transfers, and stuff like that. There is a very large, very active. Okay. Alliance, which so includes like many major banks who are interested in using yeah. Ethereum mm -hmm. okay. as part of their structure. Okay. Because obviously, you know, you send to him, you get information from him and all of that. Settlements. Yeah, settlements, yeah. And it multi-source, people who don't necessarily trust each other, are uh, all protected by private keys. Sure. Yeah? So if you're into finan financial, you know, the big financial stuff, banking and stuff, they are you know, like in the past they looked at other blockchain technology, now Ethereum seems to be the 
This is sort of a choice. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about the you know, about transactions per second. So if you're doing a bank, <coughs> we're trading on these things. It, like a bank it, it does depend, right? Yeah. We're nowhere near the right rates at the moment, but you have to understand Ethereum is, what, four years old? And it has got some of the brightest minds in the business working on it. Um, they're, they're, they're working on sharding and don't know what else to, to get the rates up. I mean, you know, the first target is to be able to match Visa. 25,000 yeah. yeah. I mean, we're nowhere near it, but... How much is Ethereum right now? It's like... I don't, I don't know. Bitcoin is like 15 or 7. No, yeah. Ethereum is 15. I'm not sure. But I mean, you know, it, it, it is, yeah, it's still, quite, it's still quite slow. I mean, you know, it's a few thousand a day. But, you know... Come here. What's the question? You think a thousand a day? No, I think I'm wrong. Actually. No, it's, no, it's way more than that. Because I mean, you can get you can get 300 in the block now. I, can't, I, I seriously can't remember. It's, it's, it's always going up. Um, 1,200. Huh? Uh, wait. Uh, yeah, around 700 to 1,000 transactions per day. Okay. So it's like a lot per, per day. day. Yeah. So it's like 15, 14. Uh, How many per day? Uh, 800. So do I yeah. I, I, th I, th I think they, they did get over a thousand, certainly. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, it's in its infancy, but there are lots of technologies being evaluated to increase that. The first one is, of course, getting rid of getting rid of the proof of work mining, which will in, which will speed everything up, and then sharding and various other things. I sat in I sat in a room with Vitalik Buterin talking about all of these technologies that he had, that he had on the roadmap. I understood one word in ten. Yeah, miss the key. Right. Um, so yeah, there. You know, smart guys are out there. They're working on it, um, and they, ha you know, they they have these numbers in their sites. Okay, are you ready, young sir? I mean, maybe do you guys want to do uh, a tea break or relax for a second because we're going to go intense <laughs> with a lot of more confusing stuff, perhaps. Uh, Fifteen minutes break. Ten minutes break. Um, and we can mix and mingle, ask more questions. I want to get a better sense of like of the room. What are the questions? What's confusing? What's not? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, please ask questions. Speak out. Maybe we should like do big, a few steps back and explain some core things before we go into like more hardcore things. Uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Let's do ten minutes and be. It's like fifteen, fifteen on my atomic clock. Like I'm gonna be jumping all over the place and giving like examples that relate to um, things that we discussed, right? So like when people were asking like whether contracts can be seen by anyone, so like this is like an example of uh, CryptoKitties, um, one of their contracts, right? And someone else was asking about like whether, um, like what happens when I screw up a contract and um, like how do you redeploy it? So like the answer is like you cannot redeploy it once you deploy the contract, it's there forever. It's gonna have this, well it's sort of there forever unless you self-destruct it. Uh, which still kind of will remain, it's a more advanced topic, like you can still destruct the contract which will make it inactive, but it still will be kind of later part of the blockchain. Um, so someone asked about uh, what happens, like what to do if you have a complex contract and um, you want to kind of minimize the risks of making a bug there and you will make a bug there and um, it, it might be very dangerous. So like what people do is they will like split a one large project into subcontracts, like smaller apps, and then deploy them independently. And they would probably have like have a master master contract that will link to other uh, smaller contracts. Is that right, Dave? Uh, if you can. If you can. Okay. Um, so so here's like also get your code audited. This is one of the yeah. most important things. If there's any value in what you're doing. Yeah. If 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 you're really dealing with like real money and like for example, CryptoKitties are dealing with uh, quite a, well, they have just not not a lot of money here, but like twenty thousand dollars as of today, and like quite a lot of tokens. Uh, but basically, you split it into smaller contracts, and uh, anyone can. Yeah. Security is very important. So if you're doing something of like real. Uh, value uh, and dealing with real money and you like advertise it to people and you want people to send you ether or play with your game or uh, do something like make sure your contract is being audited by like uh, people who've done it before and who know what they're doing and then make it audit audited again and then again and again and maybe you will be secure. <laughs> Our latest goal to went through two sets of orders. Yeah, so like it's, it's a pretty complex thing. So like for example, when we talked about that contracts are public, like 
Etherscan is a, is a company and it's a project that very popular and people use it to like look at transactions and discover what things are going on on the blockchain, on the Ethereum blockchain specifically. There is a different uh, blockchain explorer or for like uh, other chains for like Monero, for uh, Bitcoin, etc. cetera. Um, and um, yeah, you can basically see all transactions that happened to this contract. So like this contract has an address, right? Um, and uh, you can see all the like pending transactions that are happening right now, uh, from where they initiated with, if they have, if they're sending any value. So like the interesting thing when you see that contracts are having like zero ether, sorry, not the transactions having zero ether, it means that probably someone is calling a function uh, or like setting a function. It's they're not transferring the value. They're just like um, uh, like maybe setting a certain value to in, within a contract. Um, Internal, uh, so like yeah, you can you can look at the code of CryptoKitties and, and copy copy it basically from and do your own. And someone asked about like uh, licensing. Did Simon ask about licensing, right? Or someone else asked about like what happens to your um, property rights of your code, right? So um, I had a discussion with another dude who does like VM work um, for Ethereum, and he'd like um, well probably you can license it, but you, you'll probably impossible to enforce it. Like that, it's like your private uh, license, but I don't think it's like even possible to enforce it because it's all open in the wild. Um, Ethereum clients themselves, there are like several major clients that run on real nodes. It's like Geth. There is a part part client. Um, those are the main, most popular ones. Uh, they are under uh, GPL license, um, and one of them is under lesser GPL license. So um, yeah. Um, you can copy paste the code to it. It's, it's pretty complicated. Uh, um, okay. Um, another thing that we probably did not go into detail is uh, like it's important to understand that there are different types of <coughs> networks, right? So like what you guys had uh, in uh, in Remix, right? I think that that caused like a bit of a confusion. It's important to understand. So we have here like environment set. Uh, JavaScript VM, right? That means it's like a virtual machine of Ethereum that runs within your browser, uh, within uh, this remix, right? And there are other networks. There is like live Ethereum network, which uh, where like you know if you go to Coin Market Cap, um, Coin Market Cap, that's where you will see the um, like, you know like Ethereum value and price. Um, that's that's kind of value derived from like the real network. And that's what you see in um, in Etherscan. There are like other networks um, that where like transactions do not cost money. Um, like there is a Robson and like you can run your own node. Like uh, on, on a real Ethereum network, transactions take a lot of time because they get mined and they cost actual real money. Um, if you're running again in your VM, it's, uh, it's, it's free and it's very fast. Um, okay, um, what shall we do? Shall we go and uh, like step by step explain this contract a little bit? Yay, raise hands up if you wanna get more understanding of what this means. What are we doing here? It's uh, something in general. Um, <laughs> it is a the bottom one that is there. Okay. Um, do you guys wanna yeah, it's impossible to see that. Okay, that's that's right. Um, what I wanted to do, like the main thing that I was preparing to do, is like link what you've seen so far uh, in Remix with uh, more, how to put it, like day by day uh, coding experience that you would probably have and expect because you know no one, none of you guys probably coding your JavaScript. <coughs> On, in, in your, on your job in a, in a web-based ID, right? Um, what you do is you use, you know, sublime text, for sure, right? Um, and um, there are quite a set of tools that will help you actually, like, you know, have a, your contract in Git and compile it and be able to deploy it to the test networks, to your local network, and um, to a production network as well, right? So uh, let me go, Someone, someone's asking questions here, no? No questions, okay. <laughs> um, all right, so I'll do like a s 
brief introduction around uh, what tools are all there outside of Remix. And again, Remix is like an ID where you can just like play. Everyone see me? Everyone can hear me? Okay, excellent. Um, where you can just play with contracts and like validate them really quickly, deploy them within your um, local VM within your browser. Uh, but it's, it's pretty limited. So what you want to do is you want to do several things. First, you want to run uh, a local node. Um, uh, there is this thing called test RPC, uh, which is basically a local node that will be running on your, uh, can everyone see this? Um, on your machine, right? And you can just do this by uh, npm install g uh, test RPC. No? <laughs> okay, Ethereum, can everyone see this? Let me copy paste this in. Uh, where's. Uh... Okay, so. I know it might get confusing. Um, there are several, again, um, there are several types of networks, right? So like, there is the main net where the actual real stuff is happening, and there you can have there, there's like a, three public test networks, and you can run your own local network, right? Like, which is basically one node that is not going to be really connected to the internet, I think, um, and it's really really fast, right? So you'll be able to like, test your um, contracts really quickly. So you can install this. Uh, but I'm going to show you uh, a bit more interactive kind of because you know if you run test RPC. Qu questions? No? Questions? Questions? Hey, yeah, Norm? Yeah, it's on. Uh, on uh, Telegram. It's in what? On Instagram. On Telegram. What about it? Can you ask the question? Or is there a question? Uh, can you also explain? Orchestrating actual like can you explain if this could be used for orchestrating the actual exchanges? Um, what do you mean? Like which exchanges? Um, I mean the, the example that we went through, we were checking the exchange rates. Right. Could also be used as like a service to orchestrate If the example that we used can be actually to orchestrate the real exchanges, um, sort of, yeah, if it's secure enough, if you have enough if you have a source of exchange rates that everyone in the network agrees to trust, yeah, you can you can basically use that introduction. Would it be reasonable to say that this is the equivalent of a stateful service that we just don't need to run on any server? Uh, would it be reasonable? Would it be reasonable to say that uh, a contract is basically like a stateful service that you don't need to run? On any server, it just uses uh, the blockchain to handle their requests, <coughs> retrieve responses, or do certain actions. So yeah, that's exactly right. Um, with the exception that's, of the fact that every single transaction is recorded. Yeah, so like it, it's absolutely right. Except yeah, and it's everything is public, everything is recorded, everything is <coughs> permanent and immutable. So does yeah. that make sense? I mean, I'm sure you've had things. Yeah, you, you, know, you you built you, you built your data, but yeah, you built the database schemas and stuff, and you're, you're messing around and you're and you're testing things. You get to a certain point and you think, heck, how did I end up with those values? Right. Um, right. With a blockchain, you can replay everything and find out. Okay. So um, everyone installed. I mean, like test is one example, and another one. Uh, so again, we're, I'm talking about like running a local node. This is going to be a preparation for us doing a bit more complex stuff. Another one is um, Ganache. If you go to Truffle framework, start Ganache, let me copy paste it into Truffle. Um, this is a bit like visual, like it's basically one click blockchain <laughs> kind of thing. It runs a test RPC node and it just like adds some UI. Uh, you might or might not want to use it, but it's, it's just like I want to use it right now in this workshop because it's, it's a bit more visual and you can like um, see what's going on. Uh, in a more entertaining fashion rather than just looking at boring logs like this. Because what you see right now is the same thing as, as here, right? So, um, okay, let's, I don't want to drop the mic. Okay. 
So um, again, this is like a test test environment that um, that is just like useful and handy to use and I use it for illustration. Uh, so you remember in, in Remix when you uh, were switching between accounts, right? Those are like test accounts with uh, hungry ether in them. It's just like a, for testing purposes, right? right. On real network, on real uh, Ethereum network, uh, no one's really gonna give you 100 Ether for free uh, unless you wanna pay like 10K. <laughs> um, but on your own one node uh, network, uh, you can do whatever you want. Um, so basically, yeah, you have all these accounts that are set. Uh, mining is happening automatically. We have blocks, right now we have like zero blocks that are mined, transactions, zero transactions. And this thing is running on your uh, like local server, uh, RPC server. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be jumping different topics. Um, so we covered briefly uh, nodes. So this is running, like everyone's installing this, everyone got access to Ganache, right? Everyone installed it, I hope it's running. So it's pretty useful when you're developing. Um, another thing is, um, like one thing that we didn't mention is MetaMask. Um, MetaMask, very important piece of software. It's actually a Chrome plugin. Um, huh? What is this? Oh, okay. MetaMask uh, So what this thing does is basically, um, I think there are like several Ethereum enabled browsers out there. One of them is Brave. There is a uh, MetaMask. I think there is a. Uh, my Ether wallet, they have a Chrome, extent, uh, Chrome extension as well. Uh, so when you install it, it, it creates this uh, extension and it kind of uh, serves as, um, like you're able to sign transactions on uh, different networks with this extension. So for example, if I go to Ethereum mainnet, so right now I have a certain, okay, I, have, I don't have uh, any Ether, I think not Ether in any of these accounts except for my, so I have some, like, this is like actual ether on mainnet. If I want to send to someone, I'll... <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. You've got um, ENS. I sent to you. That's right. Um, and, and there are different, uh, everyone's installed MetaMask, right? All good? Um, yeah, actually, okay, so like actually an actionable thing. If you have a uh, Ganache installed, everyone's installed it. And if you have uh, MetaMask installed, you're actually able to connect to your local uh, local test RPC environment <coughs> and and I have hundred ether here. So so oh okay so here's a great example. Um, let me actually send some ether from one this account um, into this account. How, how can I make this microphone fixed? And so I can like, get almost a volunteer and hold the microphone like that? <laughs> Mike, can I repeat? <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Any one way. I can repeat. Okay, so, um, okay, fantastic, wonderful. How are you doing, guys? Um, okay, so, uh, if it's confusing, raise your hand and ask questions. So, I just give, wanna give you an example, that you know, the magic that What's happening? So I'm gonna use. I have already imported a account in MetaMask. Gonna choose zero, and I want to send some ether from from this account to um, to this account. Okay, let's go to close account. Send amount uh, recipient amount. Let's send ten ether. Next. So this is actually like a signing process. You will if you, if you're gonna be doing Ethereum development, you're gonna see this quite a lot. If you're interacting on the real chain, that's gonna you're gonna see this quite a lot. Uh, so you can see like the summary of transaction. This is like final and irre irreversible, but we are like on private network, which is connected to to this to be nice. Um, and if I submit it, transaction failed. Go eventually. <coughs> it failed. I think it failed because I didn't didn't add enough gas. Uh, uh, <laughs> Receiving address. I'm at ten. Next. Uh, gas price. Oh, no, I guess not. Let's, let's do more gas. Submit. Why is it coming? 
Can you connect to the right network? Uh, yeah, that one is. I think you need to connect to local host. Yeah, it, it is connected to local no, host. No, no, the, uh, the one above. No. The one above that. What? So the one, the, Use the one with the port 85. No, 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 it's, it's running on the server. Yeah, it's server. So correct. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm about to give a nice example, but it doesn't matter. Do you have any, any love to sound? No, it's not. It's not. Mm. Yeah, it's not. 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 Do you know why it might not be working? Um, what are you connected to? Uh, local. I've never used it as a local node. I didn't know you could. Of course you can. No, no, no. So it's just a connection. It's 5, 7, 7, 5. It's the launch. You know, the problems with getting a launch from the network. Yeah, right now he's connected to the So, for example, if you want to track it, then you can use this one. Okay, okay. 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 Okay, <laughs> anyway, send anyway. it in Kova. In common? Okay. Uh, well, actually, I'll, let, let, I'll do the same thing in, in, in Rob's then. Um, <coughs> okay. I have some ether. Okay, I, I changed to another to another network, which is like a public uh, public test test network uh, called Robston. And I can send uh, some ether. Okay, th this one gets confusing. Uh, some ether to this address, and I want to send for next. Uh, send submit success. Okay, fantastic. It's pending at least. So okay. Oh. Uh, a bit, maybe it was a bit confusing, but okay. Uh, I'm using Roxton. It's like one of the test networks out there. Uh, it's out there to test. You can actually get like um, ether that is not worth anything uh, really, but uh, you can just let an example of me sending uh, some value uh, between two addresses from one address to another. Um, and that is like signed by me to mask on the, on the uh, Roxton network. Um, okay. Um, so, okay, we have uh, Ganache installed, we have Metamask installed. Um, I hope there is it's kind of more or less you guys understanding something, or maybe it will at a certain point will become clear. Another thing that I wanted to introduce you to is um, Ganache, oh, sorry, Truffle. So, Truffle is, um, um, is a framework that does all the compilation. Where's, where's the telegram? Um, Truffle does all the compilation uh, and like managing and testing contracts for you. Is that clear? Everyone's good. Everyone's good. Everyone's good. Everyone's good. I want to see your eyes. Everyone's good. Um, Questions? Problems? I don't see the Ganache network in MetaMask. Um. So okay, w when you when you run Ganache, you will see like test RPC server. Yeah. Um. You copy this. Um. Okay. You open MetaMask and you do custom RPC. You add RPC URL. And don't forget that 127001 is different from localhost. If, you, if you're running into this issue, that's probably like it, it's the way network is being mapped is a little different. Can you um, provide the address or Telegram? Uh, uh, okay. Um, How do I have this? It's like a lot of Vitalik stickers. Um, <laughs> Can everyone see this? Success? Everyone's there? Which address? RPC. RPC address. 
Uh, he need you to paste inside the Telegram. Ah, uh, well, are, are you running Ganache or are you running like a test RPC or something? It, huh? Yeah, so you, you will see it right here. You need to launch it. You need to launch it and you will see which port is it running on. Um, but um, I think if I post it on Telegram, people will get confused. Are you, are you guys succeeding at this? Everyone succeeding at this? Having fun? Yeah, yeah. Okay, questions, questions? Everyone's running problems? You've got a, who's confused, got a problem or something? Yes. Um, so if I'm connected to a similar Oh, okay, okay. So another thing is like you need to uh, import account. Like if, if you just connected a private key, and if you go into Ganache, this is the key thing. Show keys. So this is your private key. Um, sorry, uh, there was this confusion. Like the, the way you, like when when you just stored a uh, MetaMask, you don't have any, you don't have any accounts like this. I have a ton of them, right? What you do is you do like import account, and you have an option either JS file or private key. And if, if you go to Ganache, you do show keys, and you'll have a key. Um, and then you copy that key and paste it in, and it will be an account. Um, so if I connect back to uh, my environment, I'm on zero, it immediately shows that I have 100 ether. Does it make, make sense? Oh. Right, guys in the back, how are you guys? How are you feeling? Everything's clear? Questions? Good? Thumbs up? Thumbs down? Okay, I'll get it. Okay. No, 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 someone's having a problem. Okay, let me, let me help out. Yeah. Okay, so. No, no, that's good. You like this? Okay. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay, yeah. Okay, so. Um, <coughs> so, this is like your key that I'm not Make sure. Yeah, uh, another like very important and security thing, guys. Make sure like if you you're gonna like create right now a ton of like private public key pairs. Um, and the ones that I'm showing on screen, like, do not ever use them in production because if you use them into production and someone sends you real ether there, it's going to be stolen. Like, be careful with that, okay? Um, <laughs> um, all good there? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm, how do you download Ganache? You just go to the easy Ganache website. <coughs> There are, oh, so that's PC. Uh, no, 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 the, the uh, a lot of guys, a lot of you guys went to the Ganache GitHub. Uh, please go to Ganache, uh, Truffle Frameworks out of Ganache. Yeah, no, yeah. Like a Windows download. Yeah. Or on Windows. All good? Questions? What should I do? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about gas limit and gas price? Like what does what does that unit mean? Um, yeah, more about gas limit and gas price, right? Um, so, so okay, all all transactions. If you're setting a certain state value in your contract or on chain, they cause gas. Gas is like a variable that costs ether. Um, also, also it's important to understand that like ether is not the lowest denomination of value on a Ethereum blockchain, like the lowest one is weight, and uh, gas is like, it has a variable value of weight. So g gas price, like one gas, uh, Dave, what's, what's the like average? There's like gas station uh, website that actually tells you like the pr gas price on your real, on the real network, and usually like one gas costs, I think like five way or something like this. <coughs> Dave, is it the frame? Yeah, I don't remember. Oh, sorry. Gas price? Gas price is at the moment. Twenty-five. How much is it? Uh, probably about five gigaway, something like that. Five, five gigaway. Huh? Gigaway. Gigaway. I have gigaway. For one, one gas. Yeah. So basically, gas is like a variable thing. In your local environment, you can set like gas price to uh, 
uh, to whatever arbitrary number you can set. But uh, in, in real production network, uh, you just go to the, you know, you Google and it will tell you the real time gas price. And why, the reason why gas price is important, if you, if you like on Metamask, see here, uh, when I was sending a transaction, when I was signing a transaction, right? Um, uh, okay, the recipient, no, not the recipient address. Uh, Um, you set a gas price, how much we, but this is like only in testing world, I think. And uh, gas limit, if you run out of gas while executing transaction, like the whole transaction is not gonna go through. It's gonna get reverted and your gas gonna get, it's not gonna get burned, but it's, it's just gonna get reverted as well. All good so far? Shall we, shall we go further? Questions, questions, questions? Everyone's clear? Everyone's learning things? And uh, 10 for 18 we is one feature. Yeah. Uh, if you go to your official uh, website, you will you will see like a ton of documentation about uh, how much is one way. Um, okay. So, um, so again, um, making a step back, uh, we played around with um, with Remix a little bit, and um, Truffle is like the 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 real deal. It's like what. Um, um, what you will actually be like git committing, so to say, right? Uh, just just for the reference, there is another framework, uh, Embark, I think. What's the name of it? How do I... That's another alternative, but we're not. I'm not going to go into it. But it has some, some sexy stuff with uh, IDFS and a ton of other things. Um, yeah, but uh, we're going to play around with Truffle. Okay. Questions? Uh, Embark. It's uh, so basically what I'm, what I'm talking about right now. I'm showing you Embark and, and Truffle. Those are like um, they're building JavaScript, but those they are like frameworks. So kind of like a like you know like uh, like Rails in Ruby and Rails thing. It's like an environment and like set of tools that abstract common things for you. They basically like glue testing environment. They glue Mocha to your tests, so you can actually test your Solidity contracts in JavaScript. How awesome is that, right? Um, and you can just run a few functions in your console. Like, I don't know. Like, let me give an example of some other like thing that I have. Uh, I can do Truffle test, and it's gonna deploy. I, I'm jumping forward a lot. Okay, it failed. <laughs> no, actually, like some some some. some, some, some. Um, yeah, so Simon did an expert question, more or less. So th those are the frameworks, something for your homework that you can explore at home. Uh, we're gonna look into uh, Truffle right now. And uh, again, it's like a set of tools to help you test, deploy, uh, keep track of your contracts when you git commit them. Um, and uh, you feel more professional and confident and expert. Um, yeah. So I hope by now everyone's got um, <coughs> Truffle installed. Oh, okay, life coding. Things not gonna work even for me now. <laughs> if you felt that you were confused, you can be even confused now. <laughs> um, how to connect Metamask to Ganache? Uh, did that question get answered? Um, hope it did. Uh, let me close this. <coughs> did that get answered? Is that clear now? Okay. No one's, no one's complaining. I assume silence is good. Silence is yes. Everything is good. Good question, I wish. Um, change the light piece. Uh, change the light piece. How do I change my light? It's going to take forever. Figure this out. Mm. <coughs> 
with Envy. Do you guys want to do like a contract from scratch, like a super simple one, or do you want to continue with, with uh, ooh, now we get it cozy. Oh, no. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> yeah, <it's> the, <laughs> the irony. <laughs> uh, a different button? Can we uh, do? Okay, uh, we'll try to do a contract from scratch this time, okay? So, the, okay, you just create a, some create a new directory. Uh, uh, JSConf. Um, this is good, no? Huh? No one can see my current. Okay. Um, and I'm doing truffle in it. Ooh. Oh shit. Wrong. Uh, <coughs> uh, what is it? Truffle? Just truffle? Truffle dash CMI? Or just truffle? Truffle in it. So, uh, the, the, the. Oh, goddamn. What, what was this? Uh, my screen for some reasons. Uh, no, 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 no. So um, the weird thing about Truffle, uh, I'm not sure why they haven't fixed it. When you do Truffle in it, it creates a new project in your current directory. It does not create a new directory. So you need to create a directory first, like JSCon of Solidity, CD into that directory, and um, and only there do Truffle in it. Oh, we have, no, we have questions? I'm missing something because it doesn't move. Um, OK. Um, Okay, please, someone help Pedro. <laughs> I'll help Pedro, sorry. Um, na neighbors can help you out, no? Issues? Issues, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, cool. So we just create the, the truffle in it, what it did. Oh, you can see here, cool. You can see a few things. Contracts, migrations, test, truffle config, and truffle GS, right? And. Uh, if you allow me, I'll just use Sublime. I like Sublime. Sublime, except you can't see it. Um, can you see it? Huh? We can zoom in a bit. Uh, contracts, uh, tests, no tests. Um, uh, Michael, is it safe for me to play with the resolution? The screen resolution? Okay, so when you when you run truffle in it, it will create like a basic structure for you. Uh, contracts is where you actually keep your solidity contracts. Um, migrations is where you it's like a it's like file that deploy your contract to the network. It might be a local network, it might be a public network, it might be a test network. Um, so they are pretty important, and uh, because you probably your contract is going to be evolving over time, uh, it's important to. Ooh, ooh, God, I'm scared now. Uh, <laughs> I think it's too dark. It's like cold in the dark. You don't want to participate. Um, but I'm going to be uh, losing this game. <laughs> so um, okay, and we'll try to like by default it creates like this migration contract, which. I haven't actually used it. Uh, how embarrassing. Uh, um, which helps you keep track of uh, your migrations on the actual chain. Uh, but let's do a new, project, <coughs> new file. Um, what shall we do? Uh, what shall we do? What shall we do? Keep working. Um, I'm not familiar with what are they doing there. Group the keys. Anyone still having a problem? Okay. Okay. Um, I hope it's not overly or is it overly complex. But what what what's the contract that I'll that I'm gonna try to write? Um, I'll let's write a game. How much time do we have? We have an hour. We'll probably it's not gonna be sufficient. 
but still, um, it's a game where it's like a multiplayer game where everyone can um, vote on a number between uh, one to hundred, and whoever gets the closest to um, like thirty percent of an average value wins ether, ether right? Uh, does it make sense? So like it's a, it's like a beauty contest. So but you have to guess what everyone else will pick, right? It's clear, right? So like everyone votes from zero to hundred, um, and um, and whoever gets their number closest to like thirty percent of the average wins. Okay. Um, Okay, so we create a contract, solidity. Um, oh, okay, I'm getting stressed. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll create a second migration just in case, like it's. Uh, So we have two, two migrations. Um, we won't be doing tests for now. I mean, it's, it's really pretty cool to do them. I probably should have to show them somehow too, but um, for now, because um, and I'm going to be copy pasting from my another contract that I haven't finished. So I'm going to be cheating a little bit, but I hope it will be easy to follow more of this. Can you please zoom in just a little bit? Come again? Um, <coughs> zoom in. Zoom in. Okay. Um, hold on. Um, Uh, light thing's gonna take forever. Is that any better? Uh, a bit more. A bit more. Demanding, sir. Um, is that any better? Uh, I'll send you my con You know, my my public address. You can send me some ether, so I can like one ether is one point. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> okay. Uh, um. Okay. Okay. Video contest. Um, we gonna do. Uh, I'm sure it's gonna help. Okay. It's not gonna. It's falling. Um, I'll try <laughs> like this. No, mind. Okay. So. All right, it's public, of course. What is this? Uh -huh. Okay, so. Can I do what? Can you set the telegram? Oh, sorry. Um, oh. Oh, right. Good idea. I'll probably get a fail miserably doing here. Um, okay, hold on. Um. <laughs> Who's Marek again? <laughs> um. It's, it's 
hard enough to build in this base running part. So um, we basically will have a main function like vote. Um, actually, okay. Hold on. I'm thinking of, I'm doing a bit, getting into a bit more complex. Michael, did you turn off AC accidentally? No? Okay. Um, what should I? I'm thinking of um, I think I'm getting too complex. Um, I didn't think of a simple example that I can show you guys. Right. Um, if, I, if I fail, don't blame me. So what are we doing? Okay, so we we having an owner, uh, the person who created the contract, and just in case, uh, like a security measure that you do in case there is some value in the contract and uh, you want to like <coughs> just someone just the contract and the value can be sent back to the owner. Um, voting is basically um, will like let people at uh, different accounts vote. And um, we'll need a function that will like compute the mean. Um. There is this like convention you use there with the underscore for all like uh, arguments. It's just like easy to distinguish. And because you can load once, we'll, we'll make like evals so much. Um, oh, interesting thing. Like um, compared to um, JavaScript, you know, if you in JavaScript you just like do like uh, variable declaration. It's going to be undefined. In Solidity, everything is zeroed out. So, like the value of sum is is zero. It's <coughs> defined here by default. The same thing with if you have like a public owner address, the value of owner will be uh, zero. It's going to be zero. Zero address. Okay. <coughs> Come again. What does the payable? Payable. Oh, okay. Payable means that the function can receive uh, funds. Okay, um, that's pretty important. Public means that, um, I'm not sure that we're actually gonna get into the people part, but basically um, what you're able to do is, uh, for example, if there were like money involved, right? Uh, and I, I could have another um, like mapping of address uh, value, right? I could, I could do something like this, um, message value, uh, something like this, right? That will add um, add more. Sorry, not not both. Um, does it make sense? So this is going to be a hexadecimal number of, like, for example, if 
if this participant of the network sends uh, calls this function with an argument and with ether value, um, this contract is going to execute some logic. It will set uh, this internal state as value and then assign it to the address of, of the sender. And it will also um, add more value into the um, into the balances of for that for that walk trip, right? And we can do um, yeah um, yeah and. <coughs> So we'll make sure that voters can vote only once. the values for now. I just want to keep it as simple as possible so no one gets confused. So I don't get confused as well. Um, <coughs> what else do we need to do here? Da -da -da -da. Let me, I'll, I'll cheat. I'll look at my previous contract. Uh -huh. Sorry, and then I need to remove. Mm, yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So another important concept in, in Solidity is like, you know, in, in, in JavaScript there is like console log. Uh, in Solidity there is like no console log. Uh, there is um, this concept called event, um, and you have to like declare them, right? And they can return like only specific um, uh, data type. So I can do and and again those logs are visible by everyone. Um, let me actually look at an example. Maybe maybe. Um, Maybe uh, initial transactions, certain transaction might have a uh, no logs here. Uh, <coughs> How am I doing, Dave? Any comments? Or should I? Okay. Um, okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I, okay. The first, the first that we got a transaction which is returning something. That, like your 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 vote function. Mm. The, the only way for you to want is the result to pull it for another contract. What? Okay. Uh. <coughs> What's QTI and some I mean I, I understand there's gonna be a very efficient study previous scale, but I hope it's it more or less makes sense. Are there um, questions? Cast my code usage. What is that? Sorry, I don't know whether it's all checked out later. Oh, we can discuss later. Um, um, we can we can um, just check whether it compiles and see. Maybe I can copy paste it real quickly. Where, where was that uh, thing? Okay. <coughs> um, ooh, how do I? Uh, well, someone selected it or something? I, I have no idea what what score share is. Anyway. Um, you can write in the real time. Just 
Uh, I'm sure I can. It's just gonna. It's not like my comfort zone. So. <laughs> yeah, it's it's already pretty bad. So like I I want to like avoid confusion. I like. I mean, it's pretty bad that you guys are confused. It's gonna be even worse if I'm confused. <laughs> you don't know I want that. I don't know I want that. Um, you know, pizza, French fries. Stay here tonight. Um, so. Um, And with that payable flag, they just pay for the actual cycles they use, or do you put a price on it? Um, with the payable function. So that means that this function can receive ether. Oh, people do. Yeah. They, it, no, they nominate how much they give. Yes. Pay the, pay the flag. Yeah, so for example, if it's like a, if you're um, buying, playing, huh? buying something. If you're buying something, or you're like betting on something. But what you can do is validate the incoming amount to make sure it's. Yeah. You, you, can, you, you can like actually have like a local variable that is um, um, like sets the price if the if the if this like condition on the start of the function. Yeah, yeah. You can actually just like um, uh, you end. No, I, I'm not gonna use that. Um, you end price and if like. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I find it's pretty exciting because, like, if you do, if you do that in, like, you know, in if you if you receive payments with Stripe or anything else, like, you have to do a ton of, like, you know, authorization, like, you know, callbacks, keys, uh, back and forth between a Stripe server and here, it's just like everything is there. <laughs> um, <coughs> Where's the next back semicolon? Um, Nineteen seven. Uh, unexpected semicolon somewhere. You need to add one after the lock string. Mm -hmm. Oh, after, yeah, after the lock. There's one more lock string without the Oh, right. Thank you. I, I don't see that pixels and semicolons. Okay, more or less success. So that means that the contract compiled. Okay, and the interesting thing, like when contracts compile, they get built, and you get them in um, in this can you still see this in this build directory? And it's an also important part. Like I'm gonna be again jumping things so like we cover quite a bit of ground. Uh, when contracts compile, they create this like JSON a API files, and they are pretty important. So because they basically contain your like quite a bit of information about your code. Uh, they contain all the interfaces um, about you know all the functions. So for example, I have uh, this vote function, uh, and it's gonna have. Come on, it's somewhere. <coughs> okay, here we go. Uh, it's gonna have some information about the like attribute. It's a com it's not a constant. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> oh, here we go. Okay, ABI. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Um, so inputs load constant false inputs. Okay, so in ABI, uh, this actually kind of provides information um, about your contract and function, and you can see like the name of the function is vote. Certain outputs that we just declare. Um, so we have a um, type of inputs, uh, type of um, outputs. Uh, whether it's payable, it's payable. And so, like the, the beauty of this thing, it's not really beautiful, but uh, the interesting thing about this is like type function. Uh, when you when you build and deploy a contract, you will gonna receive this, and also it's gonna contain somewhere like the actual address where it's being deployed. If it is deployed, um, this one is just composed and deployed. Um, and you can build like a UI based or a dynamic UI based on on the ABI array. So like, in fact, when you when you look at when we looked at um, where did we look at? Um, <coughs> Yeah, at the what we've been doing with um, uh, with Dave's example with exchange rates, when you saw the contract here, that like the um, um, the output, like the way UI was generated, is because is thanks to that ABI um, uh, JSON file and that ABI information. So like it's just basically being dynamically generated based on on this, and we will need this later if we'll. If you guys, if you guys are gonna last long enough, <laughs> if we have enough patience, okay. Um, so what, that's what happens. Again, like, we haven't developed much yet. 
Uh, I know it's pretty empty, pretty boring. As right now, nothing is really happening that much. But I just want to cover like different steps and stages, you know, with this basic stuff. Yes, sir. So the migration that we wrote is only for deploy, right? Okay. So that has nothing to do with compilation. So uh, yeah, it's, it's it's for deployment. It's nothing to do with compilation. Sorry for jumping things. Um, it's just like a lot of different things that it's a bit hard to puzzle them together. Maybe you will eventually puzzle them. So basically, when I when I compiled, when I, when I did uh, truffle compile, it basically went through the code. It investigated if there were any like really bad errors uh, in it. Um, there are some warnings, and, and it generated um, what what a compilation actually does is like generates a ton of bytecode, which you can see. Uh, somewhere in the API file. Come in. Yeah, here we go. Tonal bytecode. So this is actually what's being deployed on the on your either local network or. Um, that's, all, that's all the numbers we saw earlier. Yeah, that's all the numbers that we saw earlier. Okay. So I mean, I know this is pretty low level stuff, but it's it's, it's pretty important. It's actually, I mean, like I used to be doing JavaScript for many years. And I never actually do like went in depth of like you know compilation stuff, and now it's actually pretty exciting. <laughs> um, so I, I know we haven't done much yet, but I just want to go through all the steps, uh, and let's just like, publish this contract with Truffle uh, to your uh, hopefully running uh, test RPC environment or oh, Ganache. Ganache is just like a UI on top of test RPC and it runs test RPC. Um, So another thing, slightly confusing thing about Truffle, it has two like fun two. If I do Truffle help, um, it, it has uh, Truffle migrate and Truffle deploy. It's the same thing. Um, I used to be confused in the show whether it's com confusing to you guys or not. Um, so before I hit Truffle deploy, we can um, barely can see it. Anyway, okay, success. Um, so, okay, we have this contract. I hope everyone has it as well. And um, and I have a sorry migration setup. Sorry, uh, no, no, no. Okay, main migration, which basically takes the beautiful um, contract and deploy deploy. There is like way more that you can do here. You can like set like for example with example uh, <laughs> that Dave gave about exchanges. You um, can like add um, additional. Uh, parameters here with which you deploy the contract, but for now we'll just keep it easy. If I do truffle deploy, oh, I think it's gonna fail. Uh, I know it's gonna fail. Where did? Truffle deploy. Okay, no network specified. Another important thing: truffle config. Okay, uh, here you actually specify how truffle, like to which network it will. Uh, connected when when doing deployment of the contract. Um. Okay, I'll. Uh, it should be pretty simple. I, I'll let, let me remove all the clutter. Um, so, okay, that's config file. I think we can actually delete on this thing. Just want to keep it simple and not confuse anyone because they're all confused already. Um, let's see, okay. So we have Truffle.js, right? Everyone can see it? Everyone, everyone has it? Any confused faces? Yes, problem? This thing? Uh, can I, I'll send it to Telegram for you guys in a moment. I don't have. Okay, okay. I heard you. I can fear. Oh, someone deleted everything. Okay, is it good? Yeah. For sure. Okay, cool. Okay. So basically, what this thing does, um, it, because we are running test RPC in a freaking garage, so we have this uh, server that runs an accessible this port, this RPC server, and in in Truffle, we'll be connecting to this. Environment and a network, uh, and let me run. Truffle deploy once again. Ooh, match success! Exciting. Are you guys excited? Huh? Okay. 
Um, okay, exciting thing. Okay, you can actually see stuff happening. What just happened is uh, Truffle went out and performed this, uh, sorry, performed the, uh, okay, this to migrations. It deployed the default migrations contract, ignore it for now, and the contract that we just wrote. It's like super simple, this dummy contract that doesn't do much yet at all. Uh, but basically deployed it, and it's kind of important for you guys to get started. Uh, we can see some output here. Um, this is actually the, the code of the, like the public address of that uh, contract. Uh, it's there in our local, in your local uh, test RPC network. And we can see some changes that happened in uh, test RPC itself. Um, and you know, I'm using it actually again because it's like UI, so it's a bit less confusing than just like running the same piece of code in, um, in command line. So what just happened, because test RPC is pretty fast, it's like one transaction per block right now. Usually it's like multiple transactions per block. And we can see like contract creation, contract call. This this is a thing like the migrations contract, and this is the actual um, the actual what is it? Uh, <coughs> uh, the actual contract that we that we just developed uh, in uh, beauty contest. So this is that. Um, okay, okay. Everyone, everyone's following. Any questions so far? Everyone's excited. We deployed a real contract to your local network. What is contract call again? Contract call? Which one? Um, to be honest, I'm, I'm actually not, not, not even sure what, what's, what's the call is going on here. Dave, do you have any comments? You know why it's, it's like being created for some that has been... Uh, Sorry, what, so like I just deployed a contract uh, to yeah. my network and then it additionally makes a... I think it's like... Oh, that's, that's, it's not just that you've heard. No, that's the TX hash, right? Yeah, okay, but it's, it's not, not a contract creation hash. It's uh, no, that, that's the hash of that's the hash of the transaction. No, it's the second one. Right. It's, it's a trans it's, this is the creation yeah. transaction. The contract cre creation transaction. Um, this is the second one. Doesn't have much. Oh, I don't know. That's a tr that's a truffle thing. I think maybe it's like a truffle thing, a migration thing. Or I, I think truffle probably stores um, something extra. To see. Oh, okay, okay. So this is a. Um, it sends. So it first created. Um, migrations contract is the, the trouble thing. It's a bit confusing, I know. Uh, it created the, this migrations, um, this migrations uh, contract, and it sent a status update to that migrations contract that that we performed yet another migration. But the most important part is this. So, like, this is the actual um, contract that we just deployed. This this beauty thing. And um, so, okay, um, I'll try to explain a few small things. Um, if, if we go into like beauty contest ABI file, JSON file, um, the byte put here is, is pretty much going to be the same. So if I, if I copy paste this, that's, that's the byte code. So it's exactly the same and somewhere here will be the address. So this is the, uh, I think contract address, should, this should be the contract address. And you can see it here as well. So it's, it's the same. It's the same. Uh, it's the address of your contract that you just deployed on your local network, and this is the address that you're going to use to interact with this contract. Okay. Okay. Um, and um, okay, which are next? Is this is this clear so far? Some confusion around migrations. Okay. What's the point of the migrations contract? I mean, why do we do it this way? Why why not just publish our contract? Okay. So. The migrations contract keeps track of the previous migrations that you've done. Like you, you in-depth in explanation will be provided by Truffle documentation. <laughs> yeah, but uh, could we have used just the first initial migration to, to deploy both of these contracts? Or yeah, you, you can you can you deploy multiple contracts in one, okay. uh, and you can actually do I think uh, then. And uh, you know, do miracles uh, here. Deploy a second contract. Deploy a second contract and passing like uh, so, like contract address, and you can actually like okay. Um, well, simple. Oh, token yeah. sale and coin. Yeah, simple. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so like you basically can do I don't know stuff like. Uh, deploy deploy migrations. I, I don't know. It's like a, not, let's not use migrations. ABC 
whatever, just abstract uh, ABC, ABC1, and you can make them interdependent. Um, you might give one the address of the other or something. Yeah, like if, if this contract depends on, <coughs> on the other contract, you can. Um, um, You could do something like this. If, if, like, remember, you guys, someone asked about like whether, like, what happens if the code goes wrong and like that's, for example, you initiate a new contract and one is dependent on another one. Uh, that's sort of how you do it. Um, and it can get way more complex, of course. But I'm just like I'm trying to keep it simple. Questions? 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 Uh, yeah. Yes, gentlemen. More. Yeah. Yeah, good question. Um, I think it's like we're moving a few steps forward. So, shall we go into this right away? Web3.js, please. Shall we go into this right away? That's, that's a, like a very good question. I, so I think that's probably one of the, the best questions. One, one, one of the things which everybody here has a direct application for yeah. immediately. Okay, so, okay, I'll, I'll, I wanted to do a few things here, but I think that's a very good question because we're running out of time and I think people are running out of, quest, of, out of patience. So, the Quick answer is uh, there is this thing called Web3. Um, and MetaMask is written in J3. Web yeah, and MetaMask is a Web3 provider, right? So in your in your code, in your web application, basically you will have a, you will be interacting with this variable like Web3 variable. This is okay. Like if I'll I'll cheat again. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll show you some like JavaScript finally. I'm excited to see JavaScript finally, <laughs> some React code. <laughs> uh, I'm the only person excited. Let's, uh... <laughs> okay, so okay, this is some JavaScript code finally, right? I, I, I'm just jumping many steps. I hope it's not going to confuse you even more. Okay, so basically, there was like some magic here. Uh, Web three is this library that you go to. Web three, there's amazing people from Web three Foundation. Sadly, none of them at this conference. Maybe next time. Uh, they were in Singapore, though. Wow, last year. <clears throat> um, so this, like, it's like a library that provides you, connects your code, your JavaScript code in the browser to to whatever um, network that you connected to. And make ask, okay, I'll simplify it. Um, okay. Should I give a few ideas while you? Hmm? Should I give a few ideas while you're trying to find what you're looking at? Okay. Um, let, let me just like, try to. Okay, someone's doing stuff here. Okay. Um, how to interact? Back to the question: How to interact with your contract that you deployed, right? Okay. So we have this Web three thing, um, and the important bit: you need to use uh, like a few things. You install. You do like npm install Web three. You do npm install uh, shuffle contract, right? And then, um, from your deployed, so this is actually like a bit more of a like a Matura, who does the same thing. It has like this my beauty contest uh, contract. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Fantastic. Okay, okay, we are team now. <laughs> okay, uh, so remember when we when we did the deployment, we got this. Um, okay, I think should, should I should I is it is it fine fine? Okay, um, we got this uh, contract state value file. So this is the one that you also going to keep in your um, front-end project uh, repository. And you will actually require it in your, um, uh, your front-end code, right? And then it's, you use your project, uh, sorry, your, uh, your contract, like B2B agent or B2B uh, contract, deploy instance. And then you basically can interact with like vote. Um, and I can do vote one. From, from one of the from the main account, is that more like I know I'm skipping a ton of stuff, but that does that like more or less clear? You getting like a few bits of pieces more? Yeah. What is the account? Where do you go? Okay, okay. So the accounts are coming from. Remember when we were setting up uh, MetaMask? So, um, it's, well, it's not exactly a hash. <laughs> sort of. Um, you're picking one of the. For example, it, okay, let's, let's do uh, 
If you're using MetaMask as your Web3 provider, in other words, it injects you a connection to the network, you can use the, uh, you end up using the accounts in MetaMask. Anytime you want to submit a transaction, however, MetaMask will pop up and ask you to sign the transaction. So nothing happens without you saying so. Right. If you're running parity at the, a parity node at the back end, you use the parity signer in exactly the same way. Okay. So the parity signer will come up and ask you to sign the transaction. So right. the account that we select there is the one that will be used. Um, yeah. So, sure. so okay. So like here's here's an example. So um, okay, I'm sorry to use crypto keys, but it's, uh, I think they did a pretty good job. So cheers to them. So for example, I, I am in MetaMask, right? And um, I am connected to Robsten Test Network. Test, test Network. What MetaMask does? Oh shit. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's cool. It's code. Okay, so it, it injects this like Web three. Oh, should you can't say it either. Um, <clears throat> okay, huge success. Web three, Web three library, and you can do ton of interesting stuff here. Is me the mask? Sorry, it's it's, it's a state trip, right? And this thing, there's like a huge documentation around it, and you interact with it. To do ton of to like sign different transactions like using this library you can like get um, your ether balance in your uh, in your account you can send transactions you can call functions that's like your gateway this is your like gateway drug to to blockchain development <laughs> to, to to solidity development um, so you're gonna be interacting a lot with it right uh, does that answer your question Marlis right so okay uh, an example with um, with the uh, crypto keys so. Um, so right now I'm connected to to like cross the network, and like MetaMask, their code is uh, you know calling Web three JS, and it figures out that it's a normal network. And if I connect to, for example, to main network, it's like, oh right, you're on production network, and like lets me let lets me sign in, right? And for example, I'm. We can also switch your networks, and you can switch your accounts. You might have different accounts. On account one, with like whatever random key, okay? And it kind of authorizes me there, but it, it sees that I don't have any, I don't have any keys because I don't have any keys on uh, on, on this on this account. It's like a, a it's like nothing's there. It's just like empty, nothing's going on here. If I if I switch to like my one of my like real accounts, uh, it will like MetaMask will listen to changes on Web three, and will actually like pull information from uh, blockchain that are that are specific to this account. Does that make sense more or less? Is that understandable? Shall we go in depth on something? Everyone's clear. I can see you having faces. Yeah, that's good. Um. Okay. Um, yeah. So I jumped question like topics. What would you guys want to dive into? Something? Shall I continue where where I dropped off? Or questions? Shall we make it like public driven? Or? Yeah. A, a contract. Uh, you know, a contract lives at an address, and when you send money to that address, it will live there, right? I mean, Correct, con yeah. contract has its own private like funds. Yeah, contract has its own balance and storage. There are, of course, there are exceptions that you can you can refuse your money if it's if the function fails. Yeah. It can like throw an exception. Yeah. Okay. So contracts are addresses just like any other address, in that you could um, <coughs> accept that contracts will only accept ether if you explicitly allow them to accept ether. So you saw the function, the word payable up there. You never own the private keys to a contract. Oh, sorry. Right? You never own the private keys to a contract. So uh, if you've got Ether inside the contract, you have to have code in the contract to send it out. Right? In, in the contract, in this contract, um, there is no method or 
in the one you put out earlier, there was no method to withdraw that ether. So all that would happen is people would put ether into the contract and you'd never get it out again. Which is dangerous, which is you don't oh, want to yeah. have it. That, right, that's called trapped ether, yes. Like, and no one, right. it's the same thing as like lost keys, so you, you will not be able to. you can it. put, you can allow it to transfer, you can have functions in there to transfer, which is exactly how crowd sales work. So you, right? you, you put the merchants uh, address in there, so it just comes in from one account and then forwards it to another account. Yeah, indeed, certainly. Yeah, you yeah. can have like something like this, message sender, transfer, and the number value. So yeah. like, if I call this function, okay, let, let's say I'm like, just like super simple, uh, Super uh, silly. That? It yeah, it just literally pays the stranger, like pays whoever's gonna call this function. Come again? Okay. Sorry. If you, how do you get? How do you put ether into into it? Yeah, like I, I come along and I want to buy something on the side. Okay, so you so you you've got you've got your website written, yeah, website yeah. created. Um, so like you know, normally you'd have a plug-in for PayPal or something like that. So <coughs> you want to write a plug-in for Ethereum. So your plug-in for Ethereum would normally be web expect to be web three enabled. So this is on the back end, right? No, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about front. I'm talking about front end. I'm talking right. in your JavaScript right. on the site. So you build a plugin that uses JavaScript, which is yeah. Web3 enabled. Yeah. Uh, so in order to use it, just like CryptoKitties, it would say you have to have a Web3 provider, right. of which MetaMask is one of the, one of the uh, most common, yeah, right? Yeah. Right, so then, when you get there, it will know what your MetaMask account is. Yeah. Automatically, it will say, okay, this is your account, this is your balance. Yeah. Um, and then I want to buy five, so it calculates how much you have to pay. Yeah. And when you click buy, it will send the buy transaction to MetaMask yeah. to sign. Right. And you'll see it coming up in MetaMask saying, I want to send five Ether to this address or three Ether to this address. Okay. And you sign it in MetaMask. So that's your security. So, so you actually have to press it. Let in me let me do like a super a shameless plug about crypto jobs desk and like ton of, ton of jobs. If you guys are going to be very good, actually like people hiring uh, regular engineers like you know, C plus plus and finance directs, etc. But you know, I, I I wanted to do like a while ago. I wanted to do like a super simple donate button, right? This is just like spaghetti jQuery code, uh, but it's it's very easy to understand. Let me even like dumb it down even further. Um, Oh, okay. Um, no analytics, rest removal this. Um, so what was what's what's gonna happen? I have this um the name, um the name button. So basically when I when I click, where's my donate with minimus, right? Uh, this thing pops it and I, I can like enter one ether and if I send okay, I hit okay, minimus comes in. And I'm on a real network right now, and I just entered that I want to send one ether to myself, right? To to, to whatever address it provided. And if I click, uh, sorry, I don't have sufficient funds. Oh, that, that, that sucks. Um, but okay, uh, and not a problem, but it's okay. Um, okay, let, let me try to do actually finally use the local network. So here I have a ton of funds. I have a fantastic amount of actually no no no, no. okay let's use. Uh, Robstan. Um, let's use the Robstan network. <sighs> yeah, yeah, you can do that. So, so what, what, what's the, the landscape like? MetaMask is there, but are there other players? Who yes, there are. Um, well, like so exchanges. It's like, okay, uh, let me just like, finish this real quickly. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, like, okay, come on, connect. Okay, Robstan network. Um, so if I, do I have money here? Um, okay, I have some funds here. Donate with MetaMask, I enter one, I click OK, signing with MetaMask, I'm on Robston Network, I'm sending one ether to this account from this account. Um, I have balance, okay, all safe and secure, I click Submit, and the transaction hopefully goes through. Um,
Yeah, okay, see, the transaction is pending. I, just now, I confirmed and, and paid myself on the test network, which is not much, but it's, 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 it's tough. And the way it's been accomplished, it's, it's like super simple. So Web3 is coming, like you don't have to import it in your uh, front end. It's just being injected by the MetaMask uh, Chrome extension. So like basically, if I don't have MetaMask installed, um, it's gonna do nothing. So basically right now what I've done, um, it's, it's not even gonna show the uh, uh, donate button if I open this up in, um, in incognito mode. Yeah, it's, it just doesn't show a thing because there is no MetaMask here. It's not even showing the button. Um, so, okay. And when I, when I click the button, it hits loading. You, you get the amount from prompt. And then I convert this amount to, to way from Ether. And I send it to this account, right? So this is the, um, the account where I want to send money. So this is like a super simple uh, thing. This is the account that received the money. Uh, this is a transaction and received it from this address. Um, it's that simple. Questions? Yeah. So you are asking about providers. The the only one that work that actually sorry, okay. The only provider that actually the two providers that, that I know of that work with accounts encrypted in them are Parity, which is a lot more, or MetaMask, where MetaMask's USP is basically that they that they protect your keys and they inject Web3 into pages. And apart from that, all you can ever do is send Ether. However, it is also possible to write applications with Web3.js where you handle the keys yourself. So one of the most popular sites in Ethereum is My Ether Wallet. Now, My Ether Wallet is completely JavaScript, Web3.js, but they, but you can use a private key. You can use a JSON wallet, which they will link, which they will then use the appropriate functions to do the signing with. <coughs> or you can use something like this, which is a hardware wallet. Which is, if you have any ether worth keeping, you should consider getting a hardware wallet. Um, and then they communicate this using the relevant API to communicate this. And in these devices, your keys never leave the wallet. Right. The, it, you know, the transaction goes in what goes in through the serial cable and it comes out signed again. So there are, there are plenty of things with web three, you know, using web three GS. Some of them do not need to use an external, uh, you know, to use um, another app to contain the keys. You can get the keys in another way. And of course, it, another thing you can do with web three GS, if there's something going on, you can just write things that monitor them. They don't need to, always to send transactions. So, you know, what's the state of a sale contract and you just, just extract the numbers, then you don't need any signing at all. Yes. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> um, okay, there was a, I think we were like officially, we are ending at five, uh, but we are happy to stay here as long as, as, as you guys want and we can do more Q&A and maybe code more if you guys want. Um, I'm going to answer a few questions right in, uh, what is it called, in, in, in Telegram. Um, oh, yeah. i got some t-shirts. Mm. T-shirts for questions. Yeah, who, who gets a... Yeah, it's like a. I'm just like giving you a super dummy like snippet of code, uh, just to illustrate how uh, simple it can be to just like receive uh, or send funds. So basically, um, this is like sufficient. Like you, you, you specify to as your destination address, for example, your store, your, um, um, your you have a store and you have your wallet, and uh, you specify it as this two, and then you specify like the value of your product. And when this function is being executed, the one that I sent in, uh, yeah, you can actually see it, okay. Uh, in, um, in a browser, uh, the, again, the um, MetaMask confirmation get up a lot. And when people click buy, that means the transaction is being uh, signed and you get the ether. And you, you get like this transaction verification, uh, sort of confirmation um, thing that you can, like everyone can see it and everyone has access to it. 
and you can see that it actually happens. So if you can actually like navigate to the transaction, you can like explore it, you can play around with like destination like to address, you can see what, what happened here. You can go to um, to to my site and like play around with it. There's actually like if you, if you look under, under the hood, like I made it like super dummy simple. Um, so you just can see the the person. Um, I don't know, some, somewhere there was a oh here we go um, the Ether code. So you just like you even want to copy paste it. And I think I even made a video somewhere on YouTube where you can just like follow through and understand. Well, pay payments is only really one one usage. I mean, if you got say like banks where you're signing stuff, they may not be paying through this. They'll just basically get the the fact that you owe some money into the into the transaction all right. So they got a record of it. <coughs> Come again? So, 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 so say you have uh, two bankers settling something. That, that, that they may put all the codes to do the settling on the blockchain. Conduct the actual transaction, not transfer any money or Bitcoin. So just get the record of that we agreed to pay this amount to each other. So you can just use the processing, not transfer any money, right? Yeah, you you can do that, but it will kind of doesn't make sense really. I mean, like, well, well you, you might want to transfer US dollars, and you just want to get a history of that for the ledger, right? Uh, yeah, you can do that, and like uh, I think there are like uh, other uh, blockchain projects. I will not mention the names, but they're pretty well known. You can just Google them, um, and that um, they specifically designed for banks. Um, specifically about the ledger, right? Yeah, specifically about ledger. They're like intro bank ledgers, specifically designed for the bank usage. With higher throughput, uh, they're way faster than Ethereum. They might be. They have some downsides and. Uh, some I don't think the ASX is doing that. Uh, I'm not sure. What yeah, those are. Maybe maybe they are. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, more questions? Yeah. Uh, initially, we saw how to use Remix to trigger a different method of contract. Yeah. So can you do that with with Web three? Yeah. So actually, yeah, that's a very good. That's a very good thing. So the Cool, like really, really cool thing about like this Web3 provider. Why is my UI is messed up? Why is, why is this all like that? Um, so what you can do, you can actually like remember you had this like selection of VM. You can actually use your Web3 provider and oh hold on, um, inject a Web3. So now, now Remix is connected to whatever network my MetaMask is connected. Okay. So if my MetaMask is connected to my local, um, to Ganache uh, environment, it will basically be interacting with Ganache, okay? And so the, the cool thing, what I can do is, okay, let me connect it to directly. Thank you. Okay, um, and I can do some magic. Where's my super complex? Uh, no, it's not that. Uh, JS con facility. Okay, so we have this. Remember, we deployed a contract earlier. Uh, I can. Can I? Come on. Um, Did I spell it right? No, I probably didn't. No, I didn't. I have no idea. Spelling is not my forte. Um, oh, hold on. I need, I need to keep it exactly the same. So what I can do is I copy pasted my code. And remember that we deployed this contract and it was sitting at this address. I can actually load it at this address and uh, it will compile again this thing in memory and it will provide some lovely interfaces. Okay, so I can basically, from Remix, I can interact with my contracts that are on my local machine. Basically, I'm interacting with the contract that, that is here and I can call its, its <coughs> functions. And if I call the get an owner, it will get the owner of the contract, which was set to this when I was deploying it. If I get me, nothing's gonna happen. If I vote, um, there's going to be a vote, but uh, because we're, because I'm not, uh, there is no function to retrieve the vote. But it's, it, but but it's but it happened. I voted, and everyone can see that. So okay, there is even an event happened, like voted, 
remember we had this uh, log string. So this is the log string that's event log string event happened. Um, okay. <coughs> Okay, sorry. Basically, how would you use these methods in the web app? Okay, so. Okay, then. Show my wallet. Ah, uh, no, that's going to be confusing. No, but I mean, it, it gives you. Uh, no. No, no, it's, it's going to be confusing. Show my wallet, pick up a contract, pick up the AVI. How would you do a vote from all the Like, how do you create your own web app that is going to be interacting with your own contract? Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, don't say. Okay. So, come again? Uh, okay, sorry, noise. So basically, again, when you, are you following me? Okay. When you compile and deploy the contract, you receive this um, JSON object, right? You need to require it as part of your front end app, like your, your JavaScript app. You're required, and you have to have a few other things like Truffle contract, Web3, which is like a, it's not a Web3 provider, but it's a, not a library um, that kind of provides this like gateway with the blockchain. And then you set like a cure provider, which is basically you assigning assigning uh, act, like giving access to your contract to the blockchain via MetaMask. That's a wrapper around the contract. Uh, around your contract. Yeah, it's like a wrapper around the contract, right? And then when you, you use your contract, you kind of specify like your contract deployed, and then you have an instance, and then you call the actual functions. More or less. Yeah. But uh, would that cause uh, signage through MetaMask to be triggered? Uh, if you're doing the function, like if you're calling a function that is changing a state in your contract, yes, it will cause, it will it will trigger this uh, mid-mask signage pop-up window where you can accept or reject. But just to read data, it won't. Yeah. To read data, you do not need to, you do not need to sign. Okay. And like the nuance is probably more in depth. When you read data, the read call is actually happening only on one on one node, and it doesn't cause any ether, right? And this yeah. Is, yeah. yeah. Um, if you're having certain function like vote, um, because it changes the this these are the state variables, right? Yeah. If you change any of this, you will um, have to spend gas on changing them. If you're reading them, if you have like have a function like okay, get my vote. It just like votes, um, retrieves the, your vote. It causes zero ether, and it doesn't require any signage. Isn't that possible to DDoS it? Coming in? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is, what? Sorry. Is it possible to DDoS it? There's, there's no cost of doing it. To DDoS you could, what? You, could, uh, you, you, you can't. To DDoS uh, reading. Yeah, there, there's no cost of No. No, no, no. To DDoS reading, no, because it, you read only, like, you connect it to the node, and there are millions of nodes, thousands of nodes out there, right? You, can, you, can you read only have on one node. Yeah. Read it. Yeah, you can you can bring down one node. Yeah. It's not a problem. It's costing the node owner. No. Yeah. to do that. Well, yeah, but the um. Burning power. But the network doesn't go down. Yeah. I know, but the, the, the node owner is burning power to provide that function call. Um, true, but you're more like <laughs> you're more likely to bring your machine down than you are. Yeah, who's paying for the function call? The node owner. Who's paying for the what? Sorry. Well, the, the, the guy who's running that that function. Yes. Paying electricity to, to provide the to run the node. The yes. Um, <coughs> get paid for doing that. Um, most most people do it to keep to keep the environment alive, because it's in their interest to keep the environment alive. It's not a significant like um, electricity, you know, waste if you're just reading. Um, so really popular. <coughs> but but it. If the specific node, you can, I mean, again, you can bring the node down, but you will not bring yeah. the network down. Right. You can connect to any other node. So the network is absorbing the cost of running that stuff. Coming in? So the, the network is absorbing the cost of running that stuff. Well, most of what goes on is submitting transactions. Yeah. Right? Now, when you submit transactions, it costs you money, and you ain't right. going to DDoS by spending money. Yeah. Uh, that's the whole, that's the, the whole crux about gas in the first place. 
And the other thing about gas is because you have the gas limit, you, it stops you having like infinite loops and things like that because yeah. you run out of gas. Mm -hmm. It's just like the same thing with your gold price. If, if you have a function that's providing a gold price and millions of people are trying to buy and sell gold, they're all going to be querying that function. Yeah, but they'll be querying it on different nodes. Right. You, know, you end up querying it on the one which is closest to you most of the time. Yeah. yeah. It's, if everybody is going to a single web page which is talking to a single provider, then <coughs> you've got a centralization which wasn't what you were after in the first place. Yeah. So yeah. there's no benefit for the node to actually doing the computation of the method, where does the uh, gas is the actual thing go? Sorry, coming uh, in? Where's the, okay, if you're paying, shall I check? <laughs> okay, now comes the bit which I avoided talking about. Everybody heard about mining, right? So, Running a node is not that expensive, right? I mean, I run a node most of the time on my MacBook when I, the moment I turn it on. And the only time it kept, the only time it cost me was the day I did it on mobile and I used up all of my mobile allowance in one night. Um, mining is something different. Um, the whole concept of mining, right? We're still using the same concepts that were put in place by Bitcoin, which is called proof of work. And the aim is to make sure that no one miner, no matter how powerful his machine, mines all the transactions. Because if you mine all the transactions, you could rewrite, rewrite the blockchain, right? And nobody would know. So in order to do that, then, there, there, there is an artificial contest put in place called proof of work. And what that says is that in order to submit a block, you need to make, make the block hash meet an artificial, um, what's the word, condition. You know, so for example, we could say at the moment, the numerical value of the block hash has to be less than 1,500 or something like that. Now, obviously, if you just randomly select blocks, that's very unlikely to be true, so you're going to have to reorganize, you're going to have to change nonces, you're going to have to keep on trying until you have a block that meets those conditions. And there are that, but in order, as a reward for that, you get a certain amount of ether, which at the moment is three ether for the block, plus all of the transaction fees, right? Now the transaction fee that you pay is the gas you use multiplied by the price you offered for the gas, right? So also coming into it, if I, as a miner, want to mine a block, I will choose the ones which offer me the highest gas price because I'll make the most, most out of that block. Right? So the miners get paid. That's where your transaction fees go. To the miners to keep the system fair. Now, they're, up, they're working on something called proof of stake, which is supposed to be another way of keeping it fair. It's not quite there. Yep. Sorry, can we run off on that? The, 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 the Ether goes to the winning miner. Yes. The one that got it right yeah. first ish and published it and was accepted by the network. Correct, yes. So it, we don't distribute it to everybody. No, you don't. You distribute it to one, but yeah. it happens so often, so frequently, that it eventually is. The, yeah, I mean, because, because it's a difficult thing to win, that it relies as much on chance as it does on computing power. Um, it tends to get generally distributed amongst different miners, right? Does that kind of answer where your transaction fees go? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, um, the functions, are they evaluated once by the miner? And then the results of the function, or the new state, is that part of the block? Or like, uh, does the function need to be evaluated every time they're computing a hash? Um, okay. You, you you, you, you submit a transaction which changes the state of a contract. Yeah. Um, the miner will prove that that is valid. He'll either prove it succeeds or fails, but whatever happens, he will include it in the block, right? Every node on the network, will, when, the moment they include it in the block, they will compute the state of the Ethereum machine. Uh, yeah, so the reason I asked you that is, uh, I mean, does it cost the miner more if you have a function that's very expensive versus a function that's cheap? Because what you said is like, well, you know, yeah, the um, I mean, the the hashes, okay, right? every block has got 
a gas limit, right? So you can either have a few <coughs> really expensive transactions or a lot of really cheap transactions, right? Because you know, the whole point about the gas, pr you know, the gas price of a transaction is that you know, if you've got a repeated loop, which takes a lot of computing power, then that will cost more than just a simple piece of code. If you've got something which uses a lot of state variables, that is more expensive than using local memory because it's more comp it's, yeah, the computation of moving information in and out of state variables are actually higher. Right? So the, the, gas, the gas limit that you have to provide is actually based upon how much work has to be done. Yeah. Um, so to compute a block, the miner is also computing these hashes, right? Uh, yeah. SHA-256 in Bitcoin, I think it's a different one. Yeah, it's, it's called catch out 256 <coughs> yeah, It's quite simple. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like, it's close yeah. to a SHA-3. So, so, I mean, um, and they're doing this millions of times. They're doing yeah. This, uh, billions of times. Yeah. So how does the cost of doing that compare with the cost of computing your function, even if it has a loop that runs to a thousand inside it? Like your contract might have a function that runs to a thousand. Mm -hmm. But that's still really cheap in the scheme of things for the miner, compared to, you know, computing Kachak 256 like a billion times. Um, really cheap, as in what? Uh, I as have in seen electricity, time, the CPU have, spends on it. Well, the point is, I, I mean, now we get to economics. For mo most miners, it's still it's still economical to do so. Otherwise, they wouldn't be mining. I mean, um, I mean, I, I haven't mined for Ethereum for for about a year and a half. But I mean, I was making money out of it. Obviously, other people are people who are looking at reducing the costs. There's one project called Hydro Miner, where they where they take industrial containers full of miners, they park them right next to hydroelectric dams in Austria, and they buy wholesale electricity from the dam. <laughs> it's, um, you know, it's far more eco ecologically viable for the simple reason that they're not, you know they're not burning anything to get the electricity. <laughs> But I mean, yes. Yeah, I mean, that's why we're trying to get away. We're trying to get away from proof of work on Ethereum. It should be sometime in the next year, hopefully. Um, there, there are one or two networks out there. The the Qtum network uses proof of stake, which means you're not doing as many computations. You don't need graphic cards to do it. In fact, on Qtum they say you can actually do you can actually do mining using a Raspberry Pi if you want to, as effectively as a mainframe. Question so far? Does the proof of work uh, increase the complexity when the block increases? Um, it, it doesn't. It doesn't have. It doesn't have any impact on the blockchain. It's just. It's just. It makes. It generates a lot of heat. It uses a lot of power. It contributes to global warming, which is why I'm trying to get rid of it. Still the same. Even if the number of transaction increases, the complexity of the proof of work is still the same. Um, yeah. Yeah. As far as I know. I, r I really don't go into into that. Lot. I'm afraid it's. What's the Raman code on? How are you doing, Raman? Yeah, I'm okay. Uh, yeah, I mean we're we're over time, but I'm happy to be over time. Yeah. Um, we are happy to ask more questions. Do more coding. <laughs> do whatever you guys want. Yeah. Never trust anything. Okay, rules, security rules in in, in working with on blockchain if you're dealing with any value. Don't leave your coins on the exchange. Exchanges get get hacked. And they crash. And kind of stuff. Right. Um, if anything's got a server side, it means someone can steal your keys. Right. When you create a MetaMask <coughs> wallet, it gives you, is it 12? 12 words? Yeah, yeah it's a mnemonic. Um, yeah, it gives you a mnemonic, 12 words, just like the ones you see at the top there. Using those in a formula called BIP39, you can regenerate the private key, public key pair. When you get, uh, so MetaMask tells them you're supposed to write them down. Don't be like the clever person who stored it in Ethan. And what's he called? Evernote? 
<laughs> and then, and then found Evernote got hacked, and so she lost her. She lost her private keys, and she lost all her pizza. So, yeah, right. There's some magic here. Like for example, if I use the same mnemonic, do not. Use, this is a popular mnemonic. Do not use it. Like in any of that stuff. If I enter it here, okay. Do I have the mnemonic? Why? Uh, what is it mean by that? Uh, I think it's this extra line. Yeah, maybe there's an extra line. Um, B forty nine. Wrong one. Where is it? Probably on the It's a root key. So I use this. No? Still not? Uh, 12, 12 words, not 15. Right. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Something's still wrong. I didn't, didn't press well, it. If you go and paste that, if you go and paste the key, they give you any sort of. Calculating. Oh, if you want it, all right. So basically, in theory, it should be creating like the same yeah. list of no. key pairs as yeah. I have right now. Which which network are connected to? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Huh? It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's just like a function that takes. Mm -hmm. Derivation graph, correct? Should be. I don't know. Okay. But given the BIP39 function, it doesn't give, though that phrase does not give you one address, it gives you a sequence of addresses, right? So MetaMask has it, as I say, do not store it on a computer, write it down, take a photograph of it with a real camera, develop the film yourself and put it in a safe, whatever you want to do. But certainly don't store it in Evernote or something where it, which could be hacked. Um, you have these wallets that I showed you before, which are the, uh, where's it going? <coughs> this is a Ledger Nano. This does the same thing. Your software can talk to it through a USB cable. This does the signing. You've got little buttons on here. When you first initialize it, in it initialize it into a random state, it gives you a 24-bit phrase. You write it down, you don't, right? And if you do that, you might also want to think about some way that you can distribute it to a few <coughs> relatives so that if you pop, pop off, um, wife and family can be looked after, or husband and family, or whoever, right? Um, security is very important. Right, so that, that now brings us, so like, your wallets should never have a back end. Most of the phishing attacks that take place are fake site, you know, fakes of sites like MyEtherWallet, where they put a back end on it. They ask you to upload the JSON file, put in the password, which is exactly what, Meta, what My Ether Wallet does. What My Ether Wallet does everything in the browser. The moment they've got a back end, you know, they got your file, they've got your, they've got your password. The next thing you know is you've lost all your ether. <coughs> yes? Questions? Um, I'll clear on like requiring this the ABI file and tracking a bit further. I have one or two. I, s I still have one or two T-shirts, but I have XXL and, and X. I think XXL and XL. If you've got any big people here, if you like a T-shirt, come and see me. Okay. No, no, Shall we go ahead? Thank you. Okay. Come and grab a T-shirt. I don't. I don't need private. I'm okay. Cool. Uh, thanks, you guys, for coming. Hope it was not too overly confusing. If it was confusing, feel free to continue asking questions in the chat. Uh, thank you all for your patience and. Um, follow up a ton of resources online, Google it. Uh, yeah, can we do a photo together? Oh, a photo. Photos. That would be fantastic. Yay! I need a hat.